welcome to our informal session. And uh, today we're uh, council briefings. We're going to start off with a very uh, special presentation by a committee that deserves a lot of credit for the empathy, compassion, and direction. Thank you. Okay. Okay, hey, welcome. Welcome, thank you. Um, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of council, good afternoon. I'm Emily Lebose, the Cultural Affairs Director, and I have the honor of um, being at one of the staff liaisons to this committee, and I wanted to recognize them. Um, we have Sh Charlotte Zito, Duff Cleaver, Tara Real, Sergeant Brian Ricardo, Beth Hunley with Cultural Affairs. We have Cozy Livis, um, you want to wave? Uh, Sylvia Strickland, George Alcarez, Irvin Cox. Did I leave anybody out? Um, Jason Nixon, unfortunately, has thrown out his back, so he will not be um, joining us, but um, he is definitely here in spirit. Um, wanted to, today, the committee is going to recap the design selection process and their recommendation to you on the preferred conceptual design for the 531 Remembrance Memorial. Charlotte Zito with the committee and Beth Hunley with Cultural Affairs will share the background on the process and then Duff, Tara, and Brian will share their thoughts on what the memorial concept, what the what resonated that with them on the on the memorial concept. But first click um, but first, most importantly, we always start our 531 Memorial Committee meetings with a pause to remember the reason we are together, to remember those who we lost on 531, and for, for those who will forever be impacted. Their memory and the legacy of their work inspires and guides our work to plan a memorial that is worthy of their memory. Thank you. Hi, my name is Charlotte Zito, and I'm a member of the May 31st Memorial Committee. Um, and I want to thank the City Council for giving me the opportunity to be here with you today and also to be part of this committee. It has been such a meaningful experience for me personally. Um, the role of our committee uh, was, was a really um, daunting one, I would say. Um, entering into this process, I felt nervous. I felt worried, I wanted to make sure to reflect the, the will and wishes of survivors, of first responders, people who experienced this tragedy firsthand. Um, we were tasked with creating a vision for the memorial, um, engaging and advocating with those families and survivors, and I want to say thank you to the city, um, to um, Emily LeBose, to our council members, and also to the city for securing Kearns and West in order to really fully poll and listen to the voices of families survivors, community members, and stakeholders. We really got to hear from a variety of perspectives as we considered um, the various designs, and that made me feel much better about the process. Um, we developed design criteria, which you'll hear about, um, and we selected a location at the Municipal Center um, after hearing from so many people who felt so strongly about that. Um, and finally, we conducted the selection process um, and here we are to make a final recommendation to City Council about the design that we've chosen. You'll see um, these are the committee members. And again, I really want to thank you for putting together a wonderful group with a variety of backgrounds. We all came together with our shared love of Virginia Beach. but We all come from a variety of backgrounds and learning about everything from uh, the technical aspects of a build to trauma-informed design, learning about the psychology of this project. There were so many different perspectives that came together, and this truly was a, a wonderful group effort um, and, and one that led to lifelong friendships. Um, I also want to thank our council liaisons. Thank you. Um, so, we are certainly, we've gone through this process with you in the past, but I just want to talk with you um, briefly um, about the process that we went through. We evaluated locations. We reached a consensus on the location here at the Municipal Center. Um, we considered design elements and reached a consensus together on the components that we thought would be best in our memorial. 
Um, we maintained active and ongoing, I'm sorry, um, engagement with the families thanks to the city's um, use of Kearns and West to um, engage those different constituents. Um, we solicited community input via in-person, telephonic, and online surveys. And we received feedback from many, many Virginia Beach residents, families, and survivors. Um, and we evaluated conceptual design proposals um, leading to two finalists, which we considered at our meeting last week. Um, so I know that you're already familiar with the two phases that we went through in our design selection process, and I want to thank the city for guiding us through that process. Um, during phase one, we issued a request for qualifications, and our committee came together to select two out of the resulting firms that presented, to, presented their qualifications to us. Um, those two were Dills Architects with SWA Group and Roadside Harwell, Inc. with Kirkland Studio. And then um, those two finalists presented us with a full, fully realized design with um, budget proposals, and we met to review that input and evaluate those two design proposals based on that RFQ criteria, and we voted unanimously to recommend the conceptual design by Dills Architects with SWA on March 29th, 2023. Thank you. Hello, council members, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm Beth Hunley. I'm the deputy director for cultural affairs, and my husband was a first responder on 531. I didn't work for the city at that time. In fact, I didn't even live here. And the reality is that um, there are so many people in our community who this terrible tragedy impacted. And so community feedback has been one of the hallmarks of this project. This is the third time we conducted a survey to ask for that input, because we know that there's many people out there whose voice needs to be heard, whether that's the family members, the people who were in Building 2, the first responders, or the community as a whole. So this most recent survey was on Speak Up VB, and it was open from March 3rd through the 23rd. There were nine um, scaled questions where we asked people from strongly agree to agree to neutral to disagree to strongly disagree, um, how they felt the firms met the criteria set forth in the RFP, um, such as evoking a sense of peace and of calm and a place of remembrance, acknowledgement of the tragedy, as well as whether they felt it was a place that they um, would feel comfortable going. Um, the results were overwhelming in favor of the design concepts from Dills. Um, we combined all of those scores and did an average, and we saw that 92% were strongly agree or agree that Dills met the mark, um, whereas 61% were for the other firm of RHI. Um, and then when you get to the disagree or strongly disagree, there were only 2% um, who had unfavorable feelings toward the Dills design and 15% toward the other design. And um, of the family members that we heard from who, um, who provided their feedback, and, um, and we knew that it was them, we did have some family members who responded to the survey anonymously. All of those family members um, who expressed a preference expressed a preference for Dills. And now Duff um, Cleaver will give um, the rest of the presentation here. There were a number of sites that we reviewed early on in the process prior to even the selection of the finalist presenters. Um, and the one that seemed to resonate not only with committee members, but also those who responded from the, the public, the families, the survivors, was the site um, on the northeast corner of Princess Anne Road and Nimmo Parkway. Um, in addition to having the predominant water feature existent, um, it also seemed to check a number of other boxes. Uh, and due to the fact that it was already city property, um, it had a nearby parking lot sufficient to suit the needs of the communications building as well as the memorial. Um, but it also has all of the needed utilities and infrastructure already on site, so that we felt that that would both aid in the time and the cost of developing the memorial. From the very beginning, uh, the Dills proposal 
resonated with everyone who saw it. Um, you've heard what Beth had to say about the respondents to the surveys, but the, the whole concept of a pathway or pathways um, that was inherent in their presentation um, was very, very strong. There was no question about the fact that due to their local connections, they had an inherent interest and love for the project. Um, but they also wove together four distinct areas uh, to bring the whole experience of reflection and quiet and solitude and use of water and the sound of water to a real experience that we feel once it's fine-tuned as a design will be something that everyone can be very, very proud of and very moved by. Tara? Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of council. I'm Tara Real, and many of you know that um, I had the pleasure of serving your city for about 10 years. Um, you're gonna meet one of my colleagues I started with as a temp. I'll tell his story in a moment. But just a couple of things that I want you to know is first, this is really about storytelling, telling the stories of everybody who was affected that day. And I think that's what really stood out for the Dill's conceptual design is that it told so many elements of our particular story. They also developed and ended up making the design for Sandy Hook as well. So this is connected to that. So they have a firm understanding of what we're dealing with. And not only that, we were impressed with the way that they had so much compassion. And they also knew some of the members that we lost that day. Um, I do want to mention that this is scalable. That was something that was important to us. And so we do want to see all of these elements that we're telling you about today in this design, but I want to impress upon everyone in this room and also the public that this is a conceptual design and some of this might change. But I'm here today to uh, dive a little bit deeper into what you're going to see when you enter this design. And we start with the entry itself. And in this, you see lines that represent the 12 lifetimes that were lost. Um, and every foot is a length of being in one year. And I know that we have hit home with public service, but I, I also want to mention, um, because we received some comments from Mrs. Snelling, Bert Snelling was a contractor. I know he was a dear friend of our mayor. And he is not lost here. He, he was a contractor, and he is represented here. His story is represented. And, and I just want to keep impressing that upon you, is that we tried to represent everybody in this tragedy. If we can go back to the, the next slide. After the survey came out, I received a message at 4 a.m. in the morning asking me if the survivors were remembered. So I want to impress that upon you as well that the Survivor's Grove really stuck out um, with us, and also those who survived this tragedy. This was very, very important to them. Um, we feel that this will serve as a gathering place um, whenever we have a commemoration. But this is really dedicated to the direct survivors, and there's many levels of that. There are those of us who were in the building, those of us who were searching for people in the building, um, it touched our entire community. So this is this is the entrance of what the experience was and, and what Dills did and also SWA with Sandy Hook is they made this a journey of grief. And they were very thoughtful about their approach and the design. Um, but I'll leave you to read the rest of the comments. But I know that I'm very proud to introduce somebody to you, uh, Sergeant Brian Ricardo. Um, sorry. Brian, I'm gonna say a few words. When I started my career with the city, I was a temp, and I actually worked at the 4th Precinct with Sergeant Ricardo, and I wanna thank him publicly because he saved many of the people that I know out of that building that day. I believe you were the fifth in, and I know I have received so many expressions of appreciation for what he did that day and how he laid his life down for them. So he is going to talk about an important part of um, this memorial, which is the hero tree, to recognize all the first responders and those who acted heroically that day. So, Brian. Uh, 
I am Brian Ricardo. I'm a sergeant with the Virginia Beach Police Department. On May 31st, 2019, I had started work that day at 6.30. I was assigned as the supervisor for security and response to a number of events at the oceanfront for the Warrior Week. We'll Warrior Week Patriotic Festival. I don't like standing behind things. It's just a, sorry about that. Um, uh, some of the events had ended early, so I decided to go back to our office at Special Operations, which is right down the street, about five minutes away on Leroy Road, to do some paperwork and some admin. Um, I'd called uh, the wife because we were supposed to eat dinner together before I went back down to the oceanfront to continue the work for the day. Uh, while I was talking to her on the phone, I heard the call go out that we had an active shooter in building number two. Um, I did respond uh, to building number two. I was there. I wasn't the fifth in, but I was pretty close. I went in through the east entrance, and then I spent um, about the next six hours in the building. I um, personally laid hands on 11 of the 12 folks that were in the building. I did not see the deceased that was outside um, because I had made entry and never left. I personally rescued uh, 30 people that were barricaded in an office just prior to us taking the suspect into custody. And then I was with the SWAT team um, because I'm embedded with them as a crisis negotiator when we took the suspect in custody. We then cleared the rest of the second floor. I, every person that was barricaded inside the second floor came to me. I remember every face. I remember everything that they did. I remember everything that they said to me as they were coming out and going down the stairs as they were being let out by other officers. I was assigned as the lone supervisor in the building for the next four and a half, five hours with 10 other officers. We stayed in the building while um, cell phones went off, desk phones went off, computers flickered on and off, lights in the building came on and off, um, and we stayed in there to secure the building. I was the last responder to walk out the door that night before our detectives and forensics teams came in. My purpose on the committee has been to make sure that I represent the folks that were there that day. I'm proud of the hero tree, and this is what struck me the most. Being in the building for as long as I was, I have, I don't say it's an advantage, I have the disadvantage of being able to walk around as I checked on all my officers for that time, and I saw not only the heroism displayed by police, fire, EMS, and our brothers and sisters over in the Virginia Beach Sheriff's Office, I was able to see firsthand the heroism that was displayed by people that were in the building prior to us making entry. The lady that barricaded the 29 other employees in her office for the time it took me to get to her is clearly a hero. Keith Cox, who I found, clearly a hero. Josh Hardy, who I found, clearly a hero. So this hero tree, whether it's gonna be this tree, um, because I know there's some concerns about this tree there now because we don't know quite the age of it. It's the biggest tree in this area. There might be concerns that it may not survive the construction process. That's okay. It's either this tree or another tree that we put there that will represent everybody in total that was a hero that day. I don't claim to be a hero. I did my job, I did what I was supposed to do. The challenge that I have is making sure that everyone's represented because quite honestly, at night, those people that came to me on the second floor are the ones that I see to this day. So this hero tree represents a whole lot of folks. In addition, it represents the folks that were not directly involved that day because there's been a huge amount of support that has been required to support people like me that have had difficulties dealing with the aftermath of the tragedy. 
So there's a lot of people that this tree is going to include, even though they may not be necessarily chiseled into the granite or the stone that goes around that tree. But I'm very proud of this tree, and this is what resonated with me with this particular design company, is because they saw that in all of us that responded. And what's really nice is once you come in through the Survivor's Grove, you're going to walk upon this tree, or at least this area, and then you're going to continue along a pathway to where you go to the traditional, what we call the memorial. So um, this winding pathway, reflecting pool, memorial glade, it's got a really nice name. It's going to be very pretty. It's going to have places for you to sit and think and reflect on what happened that day and what your role may or may not have been or what your role is in the future to help everyone that was involved. So it's a very important part. So just from Brian's perspective, um, this hero tree to me and this winding path as you go to where we're going to recognize the 12 that were killed um, is very important and crucial. And, and this is what res resonated with me. Um, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your understanding. Um, I hope you all, I know for a fact, everyone here understands how important this project is to all of us and to the community. If you haven't lived in Virginia Beach a long time, or if you're not from here, you understand immediately in the days after how this community came together, sir, and how we represented and picked each other up. And my hope is, is that um, we're going to continue to do that with this memorial or some semblance of that, because we know things are going to change. But again, I appreciate your time. Thank and, you. And Sergeant, if I could say. Uh, If I can say that we are indeed a city of heroes, and I really thank you for articulating and pointing out the, the special roles of heroism that occurred on that day. And, you know, one of the things that we're, you know, we always wanted to recognize that this would not be a forgotten event, that, that we will continue to honor those and remember those in perpetuity. And that's the reason that you and your magnificent uh, team put together such a, a plan that I think serves us all very well. And the folks that were appointed to this committee, I just have to say, are some of the most outstanding citizens that you have in Virginia Beach and represented everybody really well. So I just wanted to make sure you, you, you folks understood that. No, as well. and I'll tell you what, I had the uh, opportunity to observe you at work and I never saw empathy and compassion. Thank you. I think that Brian has put that more eloquently than any of the rest of us possibly could. So I'm going to move on to the two culminating elements of the proposed memorial. Um, once one has passed the hero tree, there is a wonderful series of, of winding low uh, water rills that lead you through the wooded glen and out toward the north edge of the water feature. Uh, and indeed, as you have already begun to see, the concept of pathways and water are a very, very key keystone portion of the design. Um, and then once you get to what we'll call the prow, uh, of the um, of the water feature, um, you're on a a circular walkway with a low wall, and engraved into the slanted top of that low wall are the names of all of the victims. Um, and you can only imagine looking at this that um, standing there and looking out over the water and through the trees will be a most impactful sort of a culmination of your tour of the memorial. Um, it's also important to understand that the, the pathway is a complete circuit. So you don't leave there and turn around and backtrack unless you want to. 
Uh, you have the ability of, of doing it as a progressive circuit all the way around or going back and forth and repeatedly enjoying the different elements of the design. One of the other elements of the DILS presentation that was very impactful, not only to the committee, but when it was made available for responders to the survey uh, to, to view, was the following video. Um, I think it will give you the opportunity to sort of synthesize uh, in motion the various elements that we have described for you in the last few minutes. But uh, I will leave you with this video, which we believe is what tells the whole story. Thank you. So as a potential path forward, now that the committee has made their recommendation, uh, staff recommends a possible uh, design bid build process um, at a date to be determined. Um, U.S. City Council would make the final decision to select um, the design firm and authorize the city manager to begin negotiations with that design firm. The design contracts usually run about 20% of the project costs, which are 5.8 million as an estimated preliminary cost. And through this design process, um, it would be a much the same um, input from um, all those affected, the families. Um, they would be giving input directly to the design firms. And um, then a final design would be um, proposed. So, um, in the um, next potential next steps for your discussion is to um, 
enter into this um, negotiation with Dills Architects, as well as um, recommending the approval of the memorial site at Princess Anne and Nemo Parkway. We're happy to take any questions if you have any. Hey, Rosemary and Michael. I'm not quite sure what to say. This is so powerful and stunning. And thank you, committee, and for the liaisons, for the hard work. I know this was incredibly difficult to, to do. And officer, your testimony is amazing. Thank you. Um, the design is incredibly beautiful. It's thoughtful, it's peaceful, it's serene, and it brings so many elements that represent life with the water and the trees and the vegetation, but the remembrance of, and I'm sure most of y'all have been to the memorial of 9-11, which they use a lot of these same elements. And I, I it's absolutely stunning. It takes my breath away. There, those that are in heaven are looking down and, and are pleased with the, with, with the work you've done. Thank you. Michael. Thank you, Mayor. I don't have any questions um, other than to um, make a couple of statements. First, I want to just acknowledge the work of the committee um, as one of two council liaisons. And I do want to thank the council for entrusting me and with this responsibility uh, to serve as the liaison. It's, it's a very weighty responsibility, um, and I'm very privileged to have a chance to support the work of this committee. Um, as uh, Sergeant Ricardo said, it is one of the finest groups of citizens that I've ever had the privilege to work with. People who are subject matter experts, people who um, have uh, personal relationships with victims from that day and survivors, family members, co-workers. Um, who love the city of Virginia Beach, all joined through our humanity and recognizing the impact that this event had on individuals, on families, and on our community as a whole. And this group of amazing citizens was supported by another group of people, the amazing men and women who work for the city of Virginia Beach as professional staff, who led us through this process, um, let the citizens take the lead, but provided the framework that this committee could be successful, and they have been successful. I think we started this, the first meeting was somewhere around 13 months ago, and I didn't even realize that until the, so, and there's another group of people I want to also compliment, Kearns and West, consultant who um, the city engaged to facilitate this process as well, who did an extraordinary job. And we were reminded in the last meeting when the committee made this recommendation that it was 13 months ago that we met for the first time. 13 months ago, this community wasn't sure what the future of this memorial would look like. And then here we are today with an amazing recommendation from um, just an incredible committee. And you all have led us through some very challenging conversations some very challenging considerations and brought, as the vice mayor said, something that's really remarkable. And um, so I, I just want to emphasize for the viewing public, for members of this body, how intensely, how professionally dedicated everyone who was involved in this process and how seriously they took this task and, and uh, the project. So all that is to say, they've done their part. Family members have participated. Survivors have participated. Impacted members, first responders, impacted members of our community have invested themselves in this process, and they left it with us today. They made a recommendation, and now it's our responsibility to make sure that this project comes to fruition in the concert with the vision that was presented today, in adherence to the design that was presented in an expeditious, responsible manner. Our community has been looking for this. Survivors, surviving family members, people in our community who work for the city and who were impacted otherwise are expecting us to deliver on this. 
and they left it with us. And it's our responsibility to find the resources and the will to advance this project in a manner that is befitting the memory of the victims, the first responders, the survivors, and everyone impacted. Because this group of people did their job. Now it's, now it's our turn to do ours and make sure this happens according to their plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I remember when I was first elected to council, it was about uh, maybe six to seven months when the tragedy occurred. And so, as you might imagine, um, being a new council person, uh, it is not something that I knew how to address. Um, but myself and others who came aboard, it was certainly a very challenging time. But we were able to persevere. And we saw a resilient community uh, working right by our side, uh, going through this difficult process and journey. And so it has been one of the greatest honors of my life to be a part of this committee, to be able to attend and listen to the members, to family members uh, and their input and their feedback. Uh, I was asked at the last meeting that we had, uh, what word would I use to describe this experience. And for me, it was commitment, seeing the commitment of the members of this committee, the staff, the families, survivors, their commitment to see this process through um, made me stand in awe. And there were some times when people were not able to attend in person. They did everything they could to attend by WebEx or some other form or called in, but they were committed and dedicated to see this process through. Uh, this memorial represents the stories, and that's what resonates with me. The stories of the victims, the story of this community, the stories of our first responders. Uh, Sergeant Ricardo, uh, he was one of my facilitators when I was in the chaplain program. That's the very first time I heard his story. And so this memorial will tell the stories of so many that we may have never heard before. Those who visit this city will learn of the stories of those who I've mentioned. And so it is with commitment um, that I will work with this body uh, to see this process through. And I thank all of you who have been a part of it and thank you to my colleagues in advance for your support. Anyone else? You know, if I could just say, you know, when this tragic event happened, one of the commitments I thought we made that we would remember in perpetuity, the tr not of the tragedy, but the heroism and the people and the, you know, used a, you know, a community coming together. And we knew back then that, you know, designing a fitting memorial was gonna, going to be a challenge in a lot of ways. There were so many victims that day, those that were tragically killed, wounded, and then were also in the building. I think over 300 people that were. But it also rocked the foundation of us as a city, as a community, uh, that we, we did come together as a community embrace. And it's only fitting. And, you know, Michael and Sabrina, we'll find a way. You know, sometimes it takes a delay to get things right. But the time has been well spent. 
We had a couple of years, we had to put things on the back burner due to COVID. But I really think in our heart of hearts that we got this right. And the final product that we're seeing is fitting the vision. I think we we're all hoping, you know, back on that day when this tragedy occurred. And I'll tell you what, I think uh, this council, we're going to find a way. We're going to find a way. Patrick? Um, if there's no opposition, is council okay with me working with the city attorney's office to put together a resolution to authorize um, me and the appropriate staff to negotiate a contract with Dills Architects and also to formally um, confirm that that site, the Princess Anne Road, Nemo Parkway location, is the site for the future memorial. Are we in concurrence? Anybody disagree? Patrick? Right. Let's so, do it. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all from the bottom of our hearts for what you have done and will continue to do. And the folks in the audience, thank you. Okay, if we can give it another minute. Okay, uh, we are ready to convene. Mr. Manager, I think we have a few people coming to talk to us today. <laughs> yes, yes, Mr. Mayor, as you know, it's just that annual time of year when all the city departments that are funded by city council come through and present their um, proposed operating budget. And also at a subsequent meetings, we'll have our CIP team. Kicking us off is Dr. Padati, our health director. Okay, welcome. Thank you. It is lovely to see you all. And for those of you who I have not yet had the chance to meet in person, um, I'm Dr. Caitlin Padati. I am your public health department director here in the city of Virginia Beach. And we are here to talk about our city budget today. So we're going to start with a brief organization summary based on the city funds that we receive in public health. That covers eight FTEs, um, four divisions or program areas that I'll talk to you about. For a, a total fiscal year proposed 23-24 budget of 3.9 million. So what we've done here, as in past years, is break out the program areas or divisions that the funds that we receive from the city go to in, in public health programming. Um, and as you know, of course, you know our, our health department is the result of a uh, cooperative agreement between the state and city. And so what you're seeing for that largest portion there are the local city match funds that go together with state funds to um, ensure that public health can provide all of the services as outlined in our agreement. In addition to that local match, as we call it, you'll see a couple of other program areas highlighted, bless you, um, on top of uh, the regular match funds that we receive from the city. And those go towards a couple of key areas. So one of them is our wonderful Healthy Families Program that many of you are probably familiar with, which is a home visiting or early childhood development program. Another is our dental services. Um, we're very fortunate here in Virginia Beach that we continue to provide pediatric dental services at the local level. We also have support on our laboratory services, which um, again, not every local health department has, and we're fortunate to receive that funding. And it's been a really important asset for us, um, particularly through COVID, but we also saw great value with this for the MPOX response and other unusual and emerging public health concerns. 
And then the last portion of the pie there is for our senior services and long-term screening services. So when we look at our um, proposed budget for the coming fiscal year, um, you'll see at the bottom, you know, if you look across at total, um, we really are essentially proposing a, a net neutral or, or same um, budget request. But there are some nuances within it um, that I'll highlight for you. So at the top for our Healthy Families program, you can see that where we previously had about 4.38 FTEs, we're requesting or proposing to consolidate that to four. That's because we had three full-time FTEs and three part-time FTEs. And due to the nature of the work and hopes to expand the program with some additional support on the state side, um, we think that we can better recruit and retain uh, key personnel by combining two of those part-time into one full-time. And so that's why there'll be an update for four full-time FTEs. And then we've also proposed um, adjusting an allocation of funding that you can see at the bottom row that previously went towards um, maternal safety net healthcare coverage that over the years, because of it expanded access to health insurance and care and other sources, has not been needed as much. So we've proposed to take those funds to direct them to program areas that we do think are in need. Um, and those include our dental, lab, and senior services and long-term care screening services areas. So you'll see that reflected in those differences in year-to-year -year funding. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, otherwise there are no significant changes to the requests that we've proposed. So again, those changes, um, that um, proposal to combine two part-time into one full-time position in our Healthy Families program. Um, and I apologize, I forgot to mention, we are requesting two new FTEs um, to support the laboratory staff program, which again, you know, we've seen as such a critical asset over the last several years. And while we don't expect that we'll need it to be quite as robust as we did, you know, at the height of the COVID pandemic response, for example, um, we do hear from the community that there's great value in being able to access those on-site laboratory services. So it's something that we want to continue and um, support with a, a key infrastructure by having two FTEs there. Um, I did also want to mention, and I think I've previously shared with council, um, and you may be aware that there have been changes at the state level in Virginia related to the Title X program, which is a program that can provide some family planning and contraceptive services. So this is a grant that comes from the federal level to the state, and there were adjustments that were made in the state's allocations um, you know, within the past year or so that impact the services that we provide at the local level. So where we previously received Title, fund, Title 10 funding at the local level in Virginia Beach, those have been reallocated to another provider to the Planned Parenthood League of Virginia, and so they'll be taking over providing those services. And then lastly, as I mentioned, in terms of changes and in initiatives, um, just recognizing that the need for pediatric dental care continues to be evident, and so that's one of those areas that I mentioned we propose um, adjusting the funding to support. Um, in terms of other topics and things just sort of going on brief, very briefly, I know we don't have a ton of time um, in public health, things I know that you are all well aware of that we continue to work on at the health department include, of course, things like COVID-19 and MPACs, um, also the public health infrastructure grant that I've mentioned that we've received and are getting underway. Um, we've also received a small portion of funding aimed at social determinants of health, and we're focusing on maternal mortality and infant nutrition, so we look forward to putting some of that work together in the coming months. Um, topics that we've been discussing and hearing about in the community lately include things like um, questions around the emergence of the resistant fungus Candida auris, which is something that you may have heard about, talked about in the media or in other spaces. It's an example of an emerging organism that we keep an eye on in public health and help support healthcare providers in the event that it is recognized to help limit the spread. So we continue to provide technical assistance around new and emerging things like that. And then even though it's a little bit early to be talking about um, back to school, we are um, undergoing some school vaccination efforts to catch uh, kids up who may be behind on their vaccines. So we've already gotten that underway and we'll continue that throughout this month and then over the summer um, to do our best to catch kids up on those critical life-saving vaccines. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to mention that um, this week, April 3rd through 9th, is actually National Public Health Week. Um, so a time where we serve to recognize and acknowledge the work of, of public health professionals and the ways that we serve the community. So if you see any of our folks out and about 
in their public health t-shirts. Um, please feel free to wish them a happy public health week and as always, let us know how we can help. Glad to hear it, thank you. Yeah, so the proposal is to help increase the salary for our dental provider and also to help support salary to get more assistance in. So in some ways, our dentist is limited by how many patients she can see depending on the support she has. So by increasing that support for her, we can increase her appointments um, and also expand where she's able to offer care. So she sees patients at our health department location in Pembroke, um, but she also has some satellite locations and does a fair amount of outreach, and we'd like to increase those things too. So by allocating more funding to our dental program, we'd be able to increase capacity for that. Is that in here or? It's included in the proposal. It's included in the proposal. Okay, Amelia, then Barbara. Um, thank you for mentioning about the pediatrics. There was one I was going to ask about. And the other, where you completely deleted the maternity, I continue to hear that we have women at risk after having their um, babies. And why? Yeah, so the, the deletion or the change, right, is related to some of the programs that previously used to be funded and aren't anymore. And that's a change that we've seen up and down in public health over the years, right? Things that get funded and then sometimes that funding changes. But I completely agree with you, you know, providing support for um, expecting mothers and new mothers and their infants continues to be really important, which is why we're really excited about that social determinants of health grant that I mentioned. And it's why we chose to focus it on maternal mortality and infant nutrition. We wanna bring together a key group of stakeholders some of you may be hearing more about that, to kind of outline what the need is and to look at how we can better support it. Because I agree, um, no matter what the funding program changes are, that's an important thing that we want to keep an eye on. So you're doing it more as a holistic? Yeah, looking more. When we talk about social determinants of health, right, what we're really talking about are all the other things that go into keeping somebody healthy. So not just when we see the doctor or when someone comes to the health department, right? But um, can we access healthy food? You know, do we have good transportation? All of those kinds of things. So looking at a holistic way to support um, those things and then coming up with the resources that we have in Virginia Beach and then what the needs are and how we might fill some of those gaps. Okay, Barbara. Following up with Amelia, because that was going to be my question. I know many years ago, the city council added maternity care uh, because of the concern that many uh, expectant mothers were not able to get prenatal care. And of course, if <coughs> this would also impact the babies born uh, as far as their ability to uh, grow and develop. And I'm really, I, I want to see how this is going to be addressed before we're going to totally eliminate it. Because I think this was one of the things, I guess, like the dental care that we had particularly added in Virginia Beach because we saw the need. And uh, now that we're reading that maternal deaths are going up, it doesn't seem to me like the time to totally take this out of our, our uh, offering. So if you're going to have it addressed someplace else, I'd like to see where. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to have a hard time saying this is something we need to delete because it's been a, a very important, I think, of offering. And I mean, we look at, like I say, not only the, the health and well-being of the mothers, but of the babies who are born and, and their ability to, to then be able to, to develop. So uh, this, is, this is pretty, pretty important. Thank you, Amelia, for <laughs> remembering it as well. Anybody else, Chris? Thank you um, for coming today. Kind of piggybacking with the maternity. Can you give us, give us an idea of some of the programming that was included in that 2022-23 um, amended, 
202,941. Yeah, so previously that went to helping provide prenatal care for women who weren't insured um, and expecting, you know, to have a baby. And what we found, and again, you know, these these things kind of change and evolve over time in terms of gaps in access, was actually that women did have access to being insured through Medicaid and other options, right? And so the number of patients we were seeing was dwindling down. I think, you know, we, we saw our last five and then didn't have anybody new. Um, and so that's when we realized in a good way, right, people were accessing care and resources through another process. But I completely agree that does not mean that the need goes away. Um, and so as I mentioned, that's exactly why we wanted to use this other opportunity to kind of look more, more holistically at if it's not as much an insurance gap, what are the gaps that we need to address? So is it, um, Dr. Panetta, is it fair to say that in the last two years as our mortality rate, um, maternal mortality rate has doubled here locally that you're seeing less demand amongst patients coming in? Less demand for uninsured patients, which again tells us about access, right? Or at least an avenue to access. Um, but what it doesn't tell us by any means is the whole picture. And there's so much more, right, that goes into um, making sure that we're supporting pregnant women and new babies. Um, and that's why, again, we're kind of looking at that social determinants view, because although insurance is not as much of in a barrier, right, as it was 10, 20 years ago, um, as you well said, our rates are not going in the right direction. And we know that there are other barriers that need to be addressed. Thank you. Anyone else, Patrick? Um, Mr. Mayor, I think, um, so Dr. Bagatti, I think you're basically saying that with Medicaid expansion in Virginia, there are not as many uninsured patients that need this care, and you're using the grant dollars that you're getting to um, provide this service or, or to cover this, whereas, whereas you used to use funds before. Is that what you're saying? Thank you. Yes, Mr. City Manager. Okay. He, knows how to boil he sure does. That's go. it. You got it. Let me ask you, is that group Access Partnership still in business? I'm sorry, which group? Access Partnership. It was a group that I was with years ago that was designed to have a safety net in the region. I'm not familiar with them, but we'd be happy to follow up. Okay, yeah, I think they might have went out of business through okay. funding, but they were a United Way company that took care of dental and a lot of other oh, interesting. Uh, you know, things. So you know, we can follow through. We can do okay. some digging and follow up, absolutely. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for what you do. Sincerely. Thank you. Thanks for having Can't us. Can't run a city without you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Sheriff Stolley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Madam. Vice Mayor and members of the council, it's a pleasure to appear before you as always. I, uh, I'm not going to bore you with the uh, b budget. I think you all have already reviewed the budget. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have for the budget, but I'd like to go in to a couple of things I think are very important for next year. And uh, first off, I want to tell you that I'm not here asking for any money other than that is currently in the budget, and I'm not going to ask you for any money in the f next year if, 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 unless I really need it. And so. Yeah, I, I, I uh, think that uh, we uh, have a good relationship, and, uh, and I want to thank you for the relationship you all have built with the Sheriff's Office over the years, and I think there's been some misunderstandings that I'd like to clarify, and that is that, you know, that, that we're, the Sheriff's Office is trying to build a, a minor police department over there, and we're not trying to do that at all. What we feel is that the uh, law, the, code, the, the statutory code, that gives the power to the sheriff, says that the sheriff shall be responsible for the enforcement of all laws in his jurisdiction. And so you know, Virginia Beach has got a charter that has a, a, a police department and a charter. And so when, it says, when they have a police department and a charter, it says that the, the law enforcement officer, the police, the chief of police will be the senior law enforcement officer. But it doesn't, it doesn't give, doesn't absolve me of my responsibilities to enforce all the laws. And so when, when, the, when the police department comes to me and says that, they need 100 deputies to work uh, something in the water. I feel responsible to get them 100 deputies because uh, it's about my responsibility to make sure that we're enforcing all the laws. And, and so that's what we do. And I think right now we're scheduled to give them 100 deputies uh, for work down there for something in the water. And then we'll have other events during the year. But uh, 
You know, when we got the statute changed, we didn't need to, we didn't need to change that statute for our purposes. The, the, the Code of Virginia is very clear that we have the authority to enforce any laws, or we have the responsibility to enforce all laws and, the, uh, and all ordinances. And so we could enforce those ordinances regardless of what the city does, because uh, it's, it's a... Uh, it's a Dillon rule state, and, and, the, and the state law provides over, uh, presides over uh, the, the localities. Now, what I want to tell you about is the part of what we've been doing at the jail is we have over 500 cameras in the jail now, about 550 cameras in the jail now, and, and it doesn't rec it doesn't, we don't record a third of the activity that goes on in the jail. We have hallways and doors, and so we, the technology didn't exist to have all the cells when, when they went, went through this upgrade about 10 years ago or about 15 years ago when they went to build and see. In fact, the, the uh, software and hardware was uh, outdated by the time we opened that building. And so, you know, it's a constant battle. And we weren't with City IT at the time. We're with City IT now, and it's working very well. But I think that what you have to realize is I spent the last two years trying to figure out how we can get drone technology and the jail because we don't want the actual drones, we want the technology that they can use on rails and stuff like that so, so we can have the uh, camera footage to protect the deputies and, and, and protect the liability issues. But what we found out is that it's too expensive to do drones and, and uh, drone technology and regardless if it's on the rail or on a drone. But we uh, are now asking for the, and have asked the city council and the city council to approve getting body-worn cameras. And I think there's a myth or, or there's an understanding that the body-worn cameras are or for the the, the uh, deputies working on the beachfront, and I think that is true. They're partially for that, but they're also for the jail, the security of the deputies in the jail. And I think that if you realize what a game changer this is going to be for the, the law enforcement, especially corrections, where we have uh, people have to record their 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 uh, uh, visits to the cells and their checks all the time. It'll all be on film now, and and I think it, uh, the film helps uh, prisoners stay better, uh, make, make, make them better prisoners, and I, have to, I think that the video will make the deputies be better deputies, and so it's gonna be a huge game changer for us, and I think it's gonna reduce liability in the jail. I think it's, you know, that right now we have deputies going in with 50 to 75 people in a block, and the deputies go in there unarmed and, and, and have to do what they wanna do, uh, you know, and I think this cures all that, and we'll have a safer jail and, and, and a, uh, uh, a uh, safer uh, community here. So I think the body-worn cameras are very important. And I also think that next year is going to be a banner year for us because we have a uh, uh, we have the redo every major contract we have they're up for re -bid. and so we're going to have to redo our food contract. And I know that the food is up up tremendously. Everybody knows that. Go to the grocery store, you see it, the prices of the food that are up, and so we're going to have to negotiate that contract. We have a medical contract that we have to negotiate. We're trying to get Centera in on doing, putting a bid, bid on that. And I don't know how successful we're gonna be with that, but uh, we, 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 spent, we spent about $25,000 weekly in food. We spent $1.1 million so far. Uh, next year, I don't know what it's gonna be because we had negotiated this contract when it was a lot, the food was a lot cheaper. We have $6.6 .6 million in medical so far, and we estimate there's gonna be $1.8 million more expended this year. And uh, we have a contract that uh, is with ZTL that uh, does our phones and our tablets and things of that nature. And, and we get paid $7,500 uh, $75, or $7,500 to do that and, and, and uh, $750,000 to do that. And we, we use that money to provide security. We have, we have the phones that, uh, you know, we... we have to hire deputies to review the phone calls, and, and we've solved a homicide as a result of doing that, and we've solved a lot of crime by doing that, but we can't have the, the uh, inmates just call willy-nilly into the community without checking on it. So we have, we have funds that we have to collect, and we, we make about five to six million dollars a year off of uh, the canteen that we run, off of the telephones that we do, and, and also <laughs> off of the uh, cutting the grass that you all are helping us with. You get to spend that million dollars twice, uh, and and so we you pay us a million dollars to do it, and then we give it back to you when when you pay us. So you get to spend it twice, and so I think that uh, you know everything's going well over in the jail right now. But I I think that you know the, we uh, we've never had a better relationship with the police department, and I think that you know you all are are been very kind to us and very good to us. But I think we deliver a good product over there, and so I'm very proud of the deputies over there, and. And uh, you know we 
if, if, if there's one of the bills that, that keep going through before the General Assembly is a bill to cut all the fees and uh, things of that nature uh, for the, the jail. And if they do that, then I've got to do away with all my programs. The state doesn't give me a dollar to run the programs. They gave me $3 million to run the mental health program. They don't give me any money to run the, middle, the uh, reentry program that we run, the education, the GED program that we run, the, the, the uh, reentry program, and, and the, uh, uh, the mental health program. I think I mentioned both of those already. But we have a lot of programs over there that we run, and we have to pay the cost of that. And so, you know, if I don't have the resources, uh, if they limit us on, on the amount of money that we make on that on the inmates, it, it directly comes out to what you you have to pay for this. And and I think that uh, uh, you have a uh, uh, a option here to to support the, the, the General Assembly's bills or not, or not to support them. And I think that it's crazy to do it because you know the the inmates. I, I've pulled the inmates, and the inmates want to keep things the way they are. And I know that that sounds crazy, but they they uh, you know you have to you have to r really watch what goes on in the jail, and and, and we can't we can't f possibly turn out the low recidivism rate. You got our reentry program has an eight percent recidivism rate. And that's fantastic, the high lowest in the state. Eight percent recidivism rate. Our mental health program has gone from ninety seven percent recidivism rate to a seven percent recidivism rate, and I think that that the money is funded by the, the the state at a one-time grant, but I think there's a lot of things that are happening over in the jail right now, and I'll be happy to respond to any questions that you have about the operation of the jail. Barbara? Yeah. Well, you just touched on some of the things that I, I certainly wanted to say. We, we appreciate so much your, the mental health program that you operate over there, and this reduced recidivism rate is just absolutely fantastic. And I know that you're doing a lot of innovative things over there, and, and it really disturbs me. Um, uh, I guess we're supposed to be getting a good amount from, I mean, how do you operate? Yeah. I see that one of the major changes and in initiatives is reduced judicial fines and fees collections. Well, how in the world can you continue to operate if the, who reduced these judicial fines? Yeah. And then I read that, um, the sheriff's office, that, that there is a reduction of state reimbursement revenue. I mean, if the state is reducing the reimbursement rate for inmates, what do they expect? The local government to pick up this difference? Yeah, that's exactly what they expect, yes, ma'am. And, and I think that, you know, right now, <laughs> right now what happens is I think they're at $14, and I think they're using a day for a state inmate. Now they get four dollars a day or five dollars a day for local inmates, but they get fourteen dollars a day for state inmates, felons, and it costs us about one hundred twenty-two dollars a day to house those prisoners. And so that money comes from the city of Virginia Beach. We get we get uh, uh, reimbursements, you know, from the state for the twelve dollars a day. And, and you know, something else I haven't talked about, but I'll probably touch on a little bit since Colin's not in a hurry to get up here. Uh, the <laughs> the uh, uh, you know, when I, when I was a police officer, and I'm probably the oldest police officer in Virginia, now a law enforcement officer, sheriff in Virginia. When I was a law enforcement officer in Virginia in 76, they had the makeup of the jail was about 20% felons and about 80% misdemeanors. Now, because of the reentry programs that we have and because of the, the, uh, the uh, uh, get the people out of jail philosophy about pretrial and, and uh, pretrial release and stuff like that, it's about 80% felons and about 20, about 90% felons and about 10% misdemeanors, and so we're getting $14 a day to house those felons. And and you know the the state has six levels of penitentiaries. We have one level. We have one level. We have to do all that security in one level, uh, and, and it's a miracle that we get it done. But you know you got the best deputies in Virginia here, and I think that you got the best police department in Virginia here too. I think Newtigate is a a, a fresh you know, source there, and I think we have a very close relationship, and I saw the new chief of the fire department come in here, and I think Kenny's a great guy, and so I don't think you had a, 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 a cohesive uh, public safety group as you do now in years, and so I think we all get along very well, and the departments work very well with each other, and we're very pleased about that. But, you know, to answer your question, Ms. Henley, the, uh, you know, I, the, the state is not, does not see mental health as a priority, as much as the city of Virginia Beach does. And, and they, they gave us a $3 million grant, but that was basically due to the people I knew up there. And I went to Tommy Norman and Chris Jones and got them to give us the grant. But 
you know, that there's been no volunteering to give a grant. I, don't, I guess they still don't have a budget up there. They have an operating budget, but not a, a full budget. And so I think that, you know, we, we are need to elect representatives that are going to try and deal with the injustice of the cities having to carry the bill on the cost of incarceration to state and if we just call it, if they just do it for state prisoners it'll be fine because it's ninety percent of our prisoners are state responsible prisoners. Somehow yeah. we've got to figure out who we talk to because this is just not right that our citizens are then having to pick up what should be a state responsibility, yes, and, and state funding. Yeah. We need to work on this. Well, I, I'm not going to ever ask you for more bricks and mortar because I think that you know we got to do what we have to do, and, and we're down in population. When I came here, it was about 1,500. Now we're down to about 950. I think is our total today, or something like that. 950 inmates, and so we're down. And, and I think our cost is going to have to go down. But at the same time, we have driving factors that make our cost go up. Like the food goes up, the medical goes up every year, and so we we tie the food to our population. And actually, as the food goes. The numbers go down. Our, our the cost of the meals go up because they having they're having to provide a large amount of food for a smaller number of, of inmates, and so it goes up a little bit. But I appreciate the question. Okay, Amelia. Well, Jerry Stalling, yeah. I was listening to you, and you are a walking institutional knowledge. Oh, thank you. you kept going through this entire thing, not turning pages and what, and it's just amazing. But not only that, I have a comment. Down my street is one of your deputies who lived there, and he sounds like you. Oh, he sounds like that. So much that he was able to just go through the body camera of this, which means you are educating them, and they would they knew the difference between the police officer. And the deputy, and they, I mean, this man stopped me and he went through this whole thing. Yeah. So that is important that not only you know, but your deputies know where, what they do, they're limited, what they're gonna do for the something in the water. And I was just amazed how that is passed along. Oh, so thank, thank you. you for what you're doing. Thank you very much, thank you. Hey, Chris, Sheriff Scully, thanks for coming today. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you help the public understand this 3% uh, that's uh, for workforce. Three percent for workforce. Uh, what was your question? What, what workforce? Can you help us understand the breakdown of the workforce yeah. uh, line item? That's yeah, represents three uh, percent of the total budget. I don't have it in front of me, but uh, uh, the workforce is is something we worked out with city council about three years ago, three or four years ago, and uh, we had the workforce. We have several areas in workforce, but the the uh, ones that are cutting the grass is the ones that I think that most people are familiar with. And so we needed, we had uh, a need to get, get the money to do that. And so I came to the city and I said, if you'll give me a million dollars to hire these 18 people to do this, uh, or 10 deputies to do this, we had to hire 10 deputies to do it, I'll give you a million dollars back each year. And so that's what we do. It's actually down about $750,000 now because the contracts are, are COVID and other things. But we originally did it for, we get a million dollars and we pay for the deputies and we, they, they give us a million dollars for cutting the grass. So we give them the million dollars back. And so it's a win-win for the city and, and, the, and the workforce because the deputies, uh, you know, supervise it, but the inmates cut the grass. And, and then we have other things too. We have kitchen help. Uh, we have trustees, the, the, the people who go through our, our kitchen and they get, you know, culinary degrees and, and, or certificates from us about get, getting jobs on the outside, so we help them with that, and our females help in the staff kitchen, and they can get the same degree or certificates as the men can get working in our inmate kitchen. We serve 1.4 million meals a year. I think it's the largest restaurant in Virginia. Now, not everybody has to eat there, but it's the largest restaurant in Virginia, and uh, I think that you know we uh, do that for $25,000 a, a week is what it averages out. But we have a, a lot of workforce but most people when they're talking about workforce want to know about the budget item that has $750,000 in it or something. Here we're at uh, 1.6 million for this uh, year. 1.6 million, yeah. And we give about we give about a million back on that. And so I think it's 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 a good deal for the city and I think it's a good deal for the inmates too. They they are, are you know, uh, there's a misconception that all the inmates are bad people. They're not. About 90% of them are good people and they just made bad decisions. And if, if we don't treat them right, they're going to make bad decisions for the rest of their lives. 
And so we need to make sure that we treat them right and, and try and get them out and, and, and become a productive community, a citizen in the community. Thank you. So to clarify that line item is going to deputies or inmates? And the line item goes to deputies. We don't pay our inmates for any work. And that's different than most of the cities around us, but we don't pay them any work. We give them time off. I think I give them two days for every 30 days they work or something like that. Yeah, two days for every 30 days they work. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Dan, thank you uh, for you and your magnificent crew of you know, sheriffs that really help make us the safest city in the country. And uh, just as a personal note, our sympathies. I know you and Colin and the rest of your family recently lost your dad, a remarkable man with a remarkable family. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I think that you have you take your parents for granted sometime until they're gone, and then you have to realize what great parents they were. And so that's the, you know, one of the things we were having to deal with. But you know, I appreciate the condolences that you all express here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Hi. Colin, welcome. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. It's it's great to be here with you. Um, this is actually my tenth year uh, giving this presentation, and uh, for some reason, I have always gone before the sheriff's office, um, having to have sat through the sheriff's office presentation today. I much rather prefer going first, but um, he he's not at the microphone. He can't respond. <laughs> Um. <laughs> Colin, it's okay. We're moving the jail to District 1. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, I, I am not going to go through the, the PowerPoint. You all have my budget in front of you and all the, the uh, requests in there. Um, very simply, uh, my office is requesting and the city manager has put into the proposed budget um, 11.14 um, uh, positions for for my office. Uh, just uh, by way of explanation, what those additional positions are for. Uh, I came to you five years ago when the Virginia Beach Police Department was first going forward with their body camera program to discuss what, in fact, we felt the impact would be on our office. And council was, was very supportive at the time and said, we want to make sure you have the people you need to deal with this. And just by way of explanation, and I know everyone sitting around the table, we've had this conversation about the impact of body cameras on my office. And I'm a strong supporter of body-worn cameras. I, th I think it's important. I think it's a good thing for, the, for law enforcement. I think it's a good thing for, for the public. But keep in mind that when an officer does have a body camera on and they're interacting with someone, that camera is recording evidence. That's evidence in a criminal case if charges come. And there's one person who's responsible for reviewing every second of that body-worn camera footage uh, when it comes to a criminal case, and that's the prosecutor involved. Ethically, all of my prosecutors are required to watch every second of body camera footage related to their case that they are prosecuting. So the example that I used before and I, I commonly use is I have four domestic violence dockets a week, um, each with about 20 cases on uh, each docket. Previously, my prosecutor might spend 30 to 45 minutes preparing one of those cases to go to trial. They would talk to the victim, they would talk to the police officers involved, they would talk to the defense attorney, review the case file, and they would be ready then to go into court and, and present that case. But once you add body cameras, it's not uncommon for there to be three or four police officers at a domestic violence scene out there for an hour. You could have one, def one officer dealing with the defendant, one with the victim. There could be children there, neighbors, other people involved. So at that point, you now have three to four hours of body camera footage that my prosecutor is required to watch in order to be prepared for that same case. So that one domestic violence docket with 20 cases on it, then has 60 to 80 hours of body camera footage that that prosecutor then has to watch in order to meet their ethical obligations 
to go into court and prosecute that case. So that's just one example of why we're required to watch the body camera footage. But five years ago when I stood in front of you and we discussed this before, the estimates were that the Virginia Beach Police Department would be sending my office roughly 15,000 hours of body camera footage each year. Um, we have gone well beyond that. And in fact, we will most likely hit about 36,000 hours of body camera footage that my office has to review in this upcoming year. So the amount of workload that has come in has, has significantly increased. And that's what these positions are in the budget, is to try and address that additional workload. If you were to walk down my office in the afternoon, you would see up on the wall in each of my attorney's offices, TVs, and they'd have two to three monitors on their desk, and they're running body camera footage on all of it, trying to get through it to meet their ethical obligations and to be properly prepared to walk into court and prosecute those cases. So they watch footage at night, watch footage on the weekends. We, we need additional help, and that's what these positions are for, is to, to try and address that additional workload. And, and I do want to say that I know council has given body-worn cameras to the sheriff's office. Um, the positions that are involved here are dealing solely with the body-worn camera footage coming from the police department. Uh, in conversations with the city manager, there's no real way for us to give a good estimate on what amount of footage the sheriff's department is gonna produce that we would need to watch. Because again, it's related to criminal cases. So if there's a deputy working in the jail recording footage, that's not something that my prosecutors would need to review. But if there is a deputy out on Atlantic Avenue working with the police department and there's a, a crime that's committed and they're a part of that, we would need to review that. Or if in the jail there's an assault and battery of, a law, of the sheriff's deputy, we would need to review that. So we agreed that um, even though council has provided body-worn cameras at this time to the sheriff's office, I would not be making a request for that potential work because I really can't place a number on it. We're going to wait a year, and, and next year when I come back, we'll be able to sit down and have a good conversation of this is what we've seen over the last year of the amount of increased workload from the sheriff's office. And, and then I will probably be making a request at that point. But, but that is very briefly uh, the basis of the increase in my budget. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that any anyone questions, may have. Any questions, Rosemary? Colin, uh, five years ago when we did the body-worn cameras, and that was a commitment that we needed to, to do, and we were a little bit behind some of the other cities, and you, very pay, you, you told us then it was going to be a space issue and as well as a personnel issue, and we committed to you then that when it was needed, come to us and we'll work it out. And so five years later, you've been extraordinarily patient. Thank you for that. And thank you for also trying to let, let's see what happens with the sheriff's department. And so not asking ahead of time so that your, your ask is very sound and balanced and, and the need is absolutely there. So I want to thank you and your, and your <clears throat> staff and, and your offices for, for what you do and, and for also being you know, physically conservative like you've been. Thank you, ma'am. Barbara? Uh, just to follow up on what Ms. Wilson said, I, I, I know this was one of the reasons we delayed buying body-worn cameras instead of just jumping right into it because you and the chief needed to kind of determine how it was going to work out and how you were going to do it. And, and uh, Rosemary did mention space. How about that? Is that you, you do have to maintain these for a certain length of time or something, and how is all that working? So the, the body camera footage is uh, maintained in the, in the cloud. So that's all with the contracts that the police department and the city has with Axon. So as far as storage of the videos, that really doesn't affect our office. So that's not a problem? No, ma'am. Well, it's, it's, it's awfully good that it's worked out as well as it has. And I, I think at this point, it's just a matter of needing the people. You think everything else has worked out pretty well. And... I do. There, there have been some, some bumps in the process, just like any new initiative is going to have some bumps in the process. 
Um, we, we had agreements with the police department early on on the process of how do things get to my office from the police department. Um, and we finally sat down and decided, you know what, it's not working. Let's come up with a new plan. And, and we've, so we've reinvented um, some of the processes along the way. But I think we really do have a good process at this point that tries to make it as easy on the law enforcement officer and as easy on my prosecutor as can be. Michael, Mr. Stolle, um, I don't really have a question, but I do have a, just a comment I'd like to offer. Virginia Beach is widely regarded as the safest large city in America, one of the safest communities in, anywhere in the country. And uh, much of that credit goes to our police department. Much of it goes to the men and women at the sheriff's office, 911 dispatchers, EMS, fire, the whole public safety infrastructure. But I think that you and your office aren't credited enough with that as being part of that infrastructure in order to keep us safe. And all you have to do is turn on the news anywhere around the country and you can see the problems that are occurring in cities and communities when they don't have a Commonwealth attorney or a district attorney who prosecutes crimes and obtains convictions. And I just want to just take this moment to say I think you are a responsible steward of taxpayer resources, but more than that, I think you and your office do an extraordinary job in maintaining safety and security and peace in the city of Virginia Beach. And I'm grateful for your efforts. And I know that many citizens share my um, sentiments in that regard. Thank you, Councilman. Chris and Barbara. Good to see you. You too, sir. Um, help us understand um, what your office is doing and some of the successes you've had with the um, adult drug court, because we have seen a significant in increase in the overdoses and uh, drug overdoses, uh, specifically here in Virginia Beach. So can you give us an idea in the public? Absolutely. And, and thank you for that question. I'm, I'm always happy to, to talk a little bit about our drug court. Um, for those who may not understand, um, drug court is designed for people who are at high risk and who are at high need. Um, oftentimes you have someone who comes into the criminal justice system due to a drug addiction. And I'm a firm believer that someone who suffers from addiction does not need to be in jail. And, and I think most judges um, will agree with you on that. We want to try and get the person the treatment that they need so they can be a productive member and have a fulfilling life, a uh, productive member of, of the community and have a fulfilling life. But um, oftentimes what happens with addiction is that it's not as simple as just telling someone, don't do this. Um, it, 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 that's just not the case. And so oftentimes you have people who come in time and time again. And usually what happens in, in the first time you come in with a drug case, you're going to get first offender status, and that's going to require treatment programs. And then your case is dismissed um, at, at that point once you've complied. Then if you get caught again, you're going to come into to court and you're going to get a suspended sentence. And at that point, you're going to be put on probation and have to do drug treatment. Usually the third time you're going to come in, maybe get some weekends, but again, they're going to try and get you treatment. Drug court is designed for those people who are in for their fifth, sixth, seventh time, where the court is sitting there going, You've done all the treatment programs that we have. We don't know what to do at this point other than to incarcerate you because we have no other options. Drug court fills that need. Drug court is there to try and give individuals who can't cope with their addiction or, or get, get beyond their addiction. It's an 18 to 24 month program that is um, very strenuous. There's counseling involved. There's supervision involved. There's drug testing. There's scheduled drug testing. There's random drug testing. And the whole idea of drug court is that, you know, falling off the wagon is a part of the road to recovery, usually for addicts. So rather than automatically kicking someone out of the drug court program if they do test positive, it results in them maybe going back into a different phase and going through different treatment and getting the help that they need to address their issues. With the goal being, let's try and keep this person from going to prison, 
let's try and get this person to a point where they no longer have to uh, run the risk of overdosing while they're on the streets and that kind of thing. So it, it, in my opinion, it's, it's an absolutely wonderful program. Um, I, I've committed uh, one of my attorneys to working in the drug court. Um, that's, that's half of, of their responsibilities. I've committed one of my paralegals to working in the drug court program because it's really important to me that we have this option for our citizens that need the help. Thank you. And as a follow up, one of the concerns that I'm hearing from constituents is those that are addicted to actually selling the drugs, uh, whether it be because of money or how are we doing prosecuting uh, those individuals, being that we're seeing a, a significant increase in the overdoses? Sure. Well, you know, the bottom line is that I, I think it's a very different path for drug dealers than I do for people who are suffering from addiction. So if, if someone is dealing the drugs, then I think the appropriate uh, path is punishment. I think, I think incarceration is the way to go. And unfortunately, we've seen it time and time again in, in the law enforcement community that when there is an overdose by someone, that that drug dealer's phone blows up with people trying to get that, that drug that killed the other person. Because the mindset is my tolerance is so high, right, that I'll be able to deal with that potent drug where that person who overdosed didn't. And so we see almost a, a just increase in business of drug dealers who are selling um, drugs to, to our citizens that are killing them. And so the only proper path for a drug dealer, in my opinion, is, is to incarcerate them. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Barbara. Well, I really appreciate hearing from both you and the sheriff how much you work with the people involved and not just lock them up and throw away the key, because I think this whole idea of working with people who have a problem to try to keep them from repeating is so important, and I really appreciate that. Another thing I know that you do in your office, and I don't see it even mentioned here, is your attention to scams, and particularly uh, with older folks. And I, I really appreciate all that you are doing to work on that, because that is <laughs> so many innocent people being the victims. And, and if you have any comment at all, but that's an important part of what you do, and I really appreciate it. A absolutely, and, and I'm always happy to provide that service and, and I or any of my attorneys are always happy to go out and speak on the subject because education is the only way to, to stop the scams and the frauds. A lot of the phone calls that come in or emails that come in, they don't originate in Virginia Beach. They don't originate in the United States. And so once money or credit card numbers or identity information is stolen, it's not someone that we're able to put handcuffs on and bring to court because they're in another country altogether. So the only way to protect yourselves from frauds and scams is to educate yourself on what's going on. And I truly believe that that is a part of my role is to help the public not become a victim. We're there for victims once, once they have become victims, but if we can prevent someone from becoming a victim, that's even better. Thank you so much for that, John. Yes, ma'am. Anyone else? Colin, thank you so much for what you do. Thank you all very much. So at this time, the clerk of courts, Tina Sinan, will come and present her proposed budget for fiscal year 24. Welcome, Tina. Thank you. Um, just a quick comment, um, having worked very closely and still working very closely with Colin and, and uh, Sheriff Stolle, they do an amazing job with what, what they have in front of them. Um, I see it day in and day out, and Virginia Beach should be very proud of both those offices, in particular the deputy sheriffs that work in Virginia Beach. Um, well, good afternoon, um, Mr. Dehaney, Mayor Dyer, Vice Mayor Wilson, and Honorable Council. Uh, here we are again. I always like to come before you to give you a quick reminder that your clerk's office performs many core services for the citizens of Virginia Beach. Um, I would especially like to welcome our new council members um, here today. Um, 
and I welcome any of you, in particular our newbies, um, to come over to my office and see exactly what the clerk's office um, does if you've never been to my office. So um, uh, the clerk's office, and you, you have the PowerPoint presentation in front of you. I won't go over all those numbers right here, but we're located on the third floor of both buildings 10 and 10B. I have 57 full-time positions and have had for quite a while. That includes myself, uh, seven in admin, five in probate and licensing, 11 in my land records department, uh, 15 in my civil department, and 17 in my criminal department, and two in the filing department. 57 people to handle more than 800 duties assigned by the Code of Virginia. Um, I would venture to say that if you haven't used my office in the past, um, you will, without a doubt, use my office at some point in your life. Um, some folks think that a clerk's office is just an office of paper pushers, um, and that's not exactly true. Um, everything we do and perform in our office will affect your citizen uh, in their life, and uh, whether it's buying a house and recording that deed, um, whether, uh, better yet, paying off your deed and, and recording a certificate of satisfaction that says you've paid off your mortgage, obtaining a marriage license for yourself or um, for one of your children, uh, becoming a notary, uh, having to probate a will uh, or a state for a loved one that has passed away, or having to qualify as a guardian or a conservator for your mom or your dad, or a grandparent who, who cannot handle their own everyday life because of dementia or Alzheimer's or, or just frailty. Um, my folks uh, are, are in particularly very, very good with those kinds of issues. Um, and we are a court of record. Uh, a lot of people forget. We are a court of record, permanent records. And, and uh, my philosophy is when we record records, it's not for those that come tomorrow to look at those records. It's for those that come long after I'm gone, uh, historical records, if you will. We record all those land records in Virginia Beach. They consist of deeds, deeds of trust, powers of attorney, judgments, military discharges, duty 214s, and we probate, probate wills and estates, handle guardianships for incapacitated adults and minors, and that's all just on the recording side of my office. We have this whole other very complex court side. We handle name changes, adoption, divorce, larger size civil suits, uh, heinous criminal matters, and everything that is appealed from the district courts comes our way. We have seven sitting circuit court judges in our court running a docket every single day. Um, I get excited talking about my staff um, because I know what they do. We're, we're technically not a city office, but I think of us that way because we serve those citizens of Virginia Beach every day. Um, my staff is really good at what they do, and I know they are true public servants. Um, as you know, all the state funding I get is all salary reimbursements for 52 full-time employees, which includes some of the fringes. The city funding I receive pays for five full-time employees, some of the fringes, and the daily operational costs to efficiently run my office. Most of everything that we receive in our budget is funding for those salaried employees, state and city. The total budget number combining state funding and locality funding is $4,969,858. And the state reimbursement, we're told, if they can approve that budget, will be around $2,712,597. That consists of salaries and some fringes, and the city is contributing a very generous $2.5 million, which consists, again, of those five FTEs, uh, the fringes and benefits, and the operating expenses of approximately around $142,000. That includes my contracted manpower. And uh, also keep in mind that 124,000 is for risk management and telephones, items that I have no control over. I told them I could do what I do with one telephone. They could take them all out and just give me one telephone that I can answer. Um, we do keep our actual operating expenses very low considering that we are the second largest jurisdiction in the Commonwealth. Um, but it is budget that continues to allow us to maintain a very acceptable a responsiveness with the workload to continue to serve those citizens in Virginia Beach and to also help in our role of public safety to the community. I'm very thankful for my city for realizing that the core government of the services that the clerk's office provides its citizens are very important to, to those citizens. Some of those services consist of remote access that we provide to our community with our online e-recording system for land records. And as you can imagine, it has been particularly helpful and necessary during the, the, the last couple pandemic years. Um, our officer of the court remote access system, which is a Supreme Court application for court filings, 
Uh, just last year, we added an e-filing piece uh, for the court sign. We also just recently added our online concealed carry permit program where someone can apply online for a first time or a renewal concealed carry permit. We continue striving to enhance our services by the way of technology, and that's no easy task because we all know technology is expensive and complicated sometimes. Uh, we continue to try and make our Supreme Court case management system better for the legal community who depend on it. We continue with our court case information on electronic docket boards that are in the courthouse on the first floor and in front of each courtroom to help make it easier for the public to find where they are, where they are supposed to be. We continue moving to try to become completely fileless in our civil department as well as our criminal department. Um, I don't know that that'll happen in my lifetime, but uh, we're fileless for the most part, I would say 80%. Um, paperless is another thing, but uh, we are striving to be more fileless than we ever have been in the past. Um, we continue in our efforts to use common sense technology to uh, be a more cost-effective component that greatly benefits the locality by reducing the costs, as well as aiding many of the city departments in the services that they offer. Uh, keep in mind that just the maintenance alone on the land record system and the Supreme Court systems, those costs are right at $500,000 a year. But currently there is no, absolutely no cost to the locality in using or in paying for those systems that might help them and aid them in their jobs. Um, more than ever, we know and have definitely experienced that those systems are critical in providing services to the public. This is typically the time where I state that the Virginia Beach Circuit Court Clerk's Office is an excess fee office, and, and we still are an excess fee office. What that means is that, so excess fees, excess fees mean that we continue, we have a large resource of fees that come in for the services that we provide. So the main reason is that um, we, we do a service, they pay a fee, those fees go to pay for the, the running of my office in addition to the other um, clerk's offices statewide. So we collect fees and the city and the locality get those fees back. Um, so that's kind of, I hope that makes sense, um, that we help fund our own offices in addition to providing those excess monies for the state and the locality. In fiscal year 2022, the Virginia Beach Clerk's Office managed to collect approximately $1,130,000 in excess fees, of which $376,000 came back to the locality. In city revenue, we have collected $13,507,000 for the locality last year. Um, needless to say, the last couple years have been very tough, especially with the court dockets, and we're still trying to play catch up with all those court cases, but customer service still remains very uh, at, at the forefront of what we do. Um, I believe my folks strive to do that every day. It's getting a little harder every day. Um, people are a little angrier when they come to the counter, in particular on the court side. So it, it becomes more of a, a safety issue that you, I never thought in the 33 years that I've been in the clerk's office that that would be one of the things that I think of every single day. And, it, and, it, and unfortunately it is now. Um, but thank you for all you do to help the clerk's office um, maintain the level that we do to respond to the citizens. I'm very grateful, and um, uh, I hope you're very proud of the work that we do in that office, and I will take any questions you would like. And we are proud. Any questions? Work. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Senator. I did have uh, did get my marriage license in your office, and I was sworn into this wonderful council seat in your office, so I had two great experiences. Can you speak to your statement here in your report about uh, recording documents in land records have hit an all-time low? They have. Um, so last year, I believe, and I, I brought um, a, a young lady who's been here about 44 years in the office, um, and she's done a lot of the land records in Virginia Beach. But we, we used to, I think last year, we recorded around 100,000 deed recordings, deeds of trust, those that uh, around there. And uh, they were about at 66, 67,000 this past year. That's a 30,000 document drop. And when you have a document drop like that, of course your fees drop. So that's where we are, you know, I was a little nervous last year, I mean, excuse me, last month, we had about a $9,000 deficit in the excess fee category of the reports. It's, it's back on top now, it's around 40, 42,000 now, and that'll grow until July. Um, so we can see what the fiscal year would be, but we were back at least on the plus side, which, um, 
it uh, makes me a little happier. We've seen a little uptick, um, Mr. Remick, in the um, your recordings in the last couple of weeks. I hope that continues through the summer. Um, and uh, that's that's all we can hope for. I hope so. Hey, anyone else? Barbara. Uh, I like the sentence here about continued restoration and preservation of the old historic books. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, yes ma'am. Because you did say that it's for people who are coming back to check things that your office is so important for. And yes, ma'am. Certainly looking at, at the historical records is. And it's, it's a little more difficult for people to, to do that now because of the access to the building. Yes. You got to figure out a way to make it a little easier for people who just want to go and do historic research. So we really appreciate all that you all do and maintaining that and how wonderful your staff is. Thanks. Thank you, Barbara. I appreciate that. Um, I'll have to talk to Sheriff Stolle about the um, coming into the building. Um, but those those books are, and, and we try to do several every year. We, we get a grant from the library and use some of our own state funding as far as that goes. Um, we have a couple of minute books, and, and those are minutes from the city long ago back to... 1691. Thank you. 1691. And they're, they're starting to fall apart and crumble if you... To, you know, people use them all the time. And uh, to restore, so the Library of Virginia would come in in years past and they would try to restore some of those pages. Well, some of the technology that used back then is not acceptable these days. And that technology is what's causing some of those pages to crumble. And so uh, we just got a, a, um, an approximate estimate of fixing one of those minute books and it's gonna be right around $30,000. So I can try and do one or maybe two if I can squeak that out from the library a year, but it, it makes it very difficult to, to preserve those books. And for me, and I'm old school, that, that's the core of my job is to preserve those records. So like I said, not, not somebody coming in my office tomorrow, but people you know, who will be here 100 years from now that can look that up. So, and that goes for wills, and you know, in particular on the will side, they can see that their great 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 grandparent lived because we have that will on record, and so it's very important for us to try to maintain the preservation of those records. You all have a, a job that's pretty hard to encompass with all the actions of today and yes, all of the actions of the past too. But you do a great job. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, Thank you very much. Amelia, just quickly, are you doing any? Digitalization of any of this? Yes, we have most of our um, the land books are on uh, our the land record system um, that we offer. They go back to the the documents go back to 1986, roughly, close to it. That, well, the, those are a little harder to get to because they're historical, so they're harder to find. But we do have them. Digitized, not not every single record, but the ones that we have been able to do that. Yes, ma'am, they are on an electronic system that you can access from home to see if we have the record. That's a free service. If you want a copy of the record, it's going to cost you fifty cents a page, which it's been forever. It's because people don't realize just touching those. Yes, so touching those books every day, and people have oil right. and lotions and potions on their hands, so. Um, it does get on those books and uh, and we do you know Colin spoke to about the scam so we have one in the clerk's office and clerks statewide are discussing it now um, the fraudulent recording of deeds deeds of trust those kinds of documents we're seeing that happen a little bit not really here in Virginia Beach but I don't know if any of you all have seen that commercial for I think it's called life lock or title lock and they have grandma on there who's lost her house and, you know, she's been thrown out of her house. Well, it's really not as um, blatant as that. But we are working on a system that we don't know which way to go because we do record a lot of land records, mechanics, liens, judgments, deeds of trust, you know, um, uh, all kinds of things that have to do with your property. So we're trying to come up with some kind of device through electronics that if somebody does something, anything with, not everything, but anything with your property, there's some kind of uh, mechanism to notify you. Did you refinance your house? Did you, you know, do something like that? It's just kind of a notification. You have to sign up for it. And, and certain people, and that, that, that's a little expensive. It's costly to do that. But it is a way to at least notify somebody that something's been done with their property. Thank you. 
at all you do, and don't go away. Okay. <laughs> all right, anyone else? Okay, thanks, you, Tina. Thanks. Okay, uh, you know, before we get the next person up, uh, we're running a bit behind, and we are on a marathon uh, track today. So if anybody does need a relief break, you know, feel free to just, you know, uh, individually, you know, they, there won't be a scheduled break. All right, Mr. Mayor, members of council, at this time, Gregory Smith from um, Juvenile Probation will come and present the Juvenile Probation Court's uh, proposed fiscal year 24 budget. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor Wilson, esteemed council. The Department of Juvenile Justice, the Department of Juvenile Justice operates in this city with four positions from the sitting office, and those positions have been reallocated over the last fiscal year. Uh, initially, you'll see a slight increase in our budget because we only had two of those positions actually uh, up and running in terms of having staff. These uh, positions have been moved around just a slightly to address two new programs. One, a restorative justice a partnership with the police department and the um, Virginia Beach Public Schools. This particular program is more so about pre-intake, pre-arrest. It's a program to allow young people to not to be brought into the system on um, less than serious charges. We've also allocated uh, positions to do something that we call RCIF, which is a reduced court involvement for families. This is our way of dealing with what was traditionally uh, known, known as CHINs, children in need of supervision, children in need of services. Our philosophy in changing these positions is that we need oversight to ensure that the most critical services and funding is utilized for the most serious kids in our system. Therefore, we have a supervisor uh, to what we're calling community intervention officers, and most recently, we just finished up interviews for a family service specialist who will do both vendor oversight and who will also do some a clinical support in terms of making sure the right kids are in the right services. Um, the only other budget piece I think that is notable is because of a COVID and staffing patterns and the primary agency that was providing services for the court was not fully up to staff. We didn't spend as much on our general service budget, which includes things like our shelter care, which includes things like our electronic monitoring, and also some of the uh, direct counseling services to young people. I, I do uh, expect those um, different um, goals that we have for young people to increase uh, in the upcoming fiscal year, simply because one, we're up in our staffing pattern, but also the agency that provides those services is able to provide those services. Um, the last piece I will say is our primary shelter care home which was the crisis group home, was closed for uh, approximately a year now. They're scheduled to open back up in the next 30 days, so there'll be additional funding in that stream as well. And this time, I'll take any questions. Any questions at all? Oh, thank you. But thank you for doing such a valuable service. And, uh, you know, this is a very important part of making us a safe community, but... Once again, engaging with youth is indeed a noble profession. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And this was my first meeting. It wasn't brutal at all, so thank you. <laughs> Magistrate, office will come and present their fiscal year 24 budget. Okay. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, Mr. Dohaney. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to meet with you here today. And someplace out there is Chief Magistrate Andrew Truitt, who was just appointed as the Chief Magistrate for Virginia Beach. He stepped out for just a moment. I'm a regional supervisor with the magistrate system. I cover the area that includes Portsmouth, Norfolk, Virginia Beach, and the Eastern Shore. And this is Mr. Truitt now. Uh, and I'm previously a chief magistrate in Virginia Beach. I started in the magistrate system in 2009 from 2016 as the Virginia Beach chief magistrate. We're sort of a hybrid because we are state employees. I do not have any city employees on my staff. 
We are appointed by the Executive Secretary of the Supreme Court of Virginia as a result of a 2008 legislative reorganization. And the Virginia Beach office has 20 full-time magistrates plus the chief position. We are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We never close. Primary office is at the city jail. We also have a second office down at the second police precinct near the oceanfront. And that's especially critical during the summertime and during upcoming events such as something in the water. Because that decreases the time that an officer has to be off the street after he or she makes an arrest. Our statutory authorities are issuing arrest warrants and summonses, bail hearings, search warrants, mental health orders, which are obviously very much in the news these days. Uh, protective orders are also a daily occurrence. And one of the newer authorities that we were given just a couple years ago was the emergency substantial risk order to remove firearms from somebody who would present a danger as a result of their possession or ability to obtain a firearm. And I know Virginia Beach has taken advantage of that authority on several occasions. Our budget is without a doubt the smallest one that you're going to deal with today, but it's critical for the effective operation of our office. As I said, we are state employees. The state also provides our computer equipment and most consumable supplies. And for fiscal year 22, the state's share of that funding was just about 1.4 million. Our city budget, though, is a requirement by Virginia code. The city or locality is responsible for providing quarters for the magistrate office that serves the locality, along with supplies, equipment, and so on. So if I need a chair, and we go through a lot of them with 24-hour-a-day operations, I do not have state funding for that. That has to come from local funding. Magistrates hired before July 1st, 2008, when the statute changed, are eligible for a $5,000 city supplement. It was capped at the 2008 level. It has not changed since then. When I started in 2009, we had 18 magistrates who were eligible for that supplement. Through attrition, that's now down to four. But that's still an essential part of those four magistrates' overall compensation. And that's included in the budget proposal that you have. The rest of the budget goes primarily for our operating expenses. There's a small share, which is overhead, the phones, the copy machine, those sorts of things. But the majority of it are for equipment and supplies. And again, I don't have another source of funding for those. It really is critical that those be included in our budget. And I thank the city manager's office for working with us to ensure that we are appropriately financed for those sorts of things. Just want to take a quick minute to talk about office renovations. Uh, back in 2009, we met with the city manager's staff and developed a plan for office modifications to provide that enhanced level of security that Tina Sinan was just talking about. Prior to that time, well, prior to 2019, really prior to COVID, people would come inside our office and sit down literally across the desk from us. If they were in custody of the police or sheriff department, there was security in place. But we deal with the general public on a daily basis, and they come directly into the office. There were no physical barriers whatsoever. So a plan was developed in 2019 to enhance security, but then COVID came along and it sort of got put on hold. Through COVID, we learned to rely upon enhanced use of video. So we've now come up with a revised plan for office renovations that increases the use of video, but will satisfy our security needs at a significantly reduced cost. And I thank uh, Assistant City Manager Monica Chaparro and her staff for the efforts in moving that process forward. We're working on that now, and I hope that we'll have that in the near future. 
And again, I thank you for your attention and would be happy to answer any questions. The mayor's not here, but I have, I have a question. Yes, sir. I remember about two years ago, we talked about the e magistrate. Yes, is that sir. something that we're still doing? or? Well, e magistrate is the computer system that we use that is provided by the state for us. It's a computer system that we use to generate processes. Uh, as separate from that, but also combined with it, we also do use video extensively. Uh, on the police side, we do have video units at the third and fourth precinct. So officers from those offices do not necessarily need to come directly to the magistrate's office. They can appear by video. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. All right, again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. All right, Mr. Mayor, members of council, at this time, um, our Director of Emergency Communications, Jada Lee, will come and present her fiscal year proposed budget. Good afternoon. So as the city manager said, my name is Jada Lee, and I'm the director for emergency communications and citizen services here with the city of Virginia Beach. And I'm going to go over our budget for the upcoming fiscal year. So we currently have 132.75 full-time employees. Our 0.75 is a... Um, Retired city employee who came back and she was our accreditation manager for a little while and now she works on special projects for me and the other members of our leadership team. Our proposed budget for FY23-24 is $12,041,822. The five divisions that make up ECCS are 311, 911, administration, technology and support and training. And I would like to note that last year, um, for those of you who were with us last year, you would have noticed we had 133.75 full-time employees. This past year in September, we entered into a federated model with the city's IT department. So now I have a full-time um, technology manager who reports directly to myself and also to the IT director. So here's our pro program budget. As you'll see, the majority of my budget is personnel. And the largest division is the 911 division. The members of this division are truly the first first responders because without these dedicated men and women of the 911 division taking those phone calls from our citizens in need, um, nobody else is going anywhere, right? So they make up 74% of our budget. And I'd also like to note that although you see that very tiny gold sliver that says training, our training department plays an intricate role in what we do every single day. They ensure that we're staying up to date and following industry best standards. They also uh, provide professional ongoing development for our current staff. And then we also, they're also responsible for training our new hires. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. So this is just an overview here of our operating budget. And again, you can see that the 911 staff um, makes up the majority of my department. And then following closely after that would be uh, training and technology and then 311. So some of our major changes and initiatives, um, the technology in the 911 profession has grown exponentially over the years. Um, I've been in the 911 profession for 31 years, and when I first started with 911, we had a recessed one screen DOS computer with a fixed keyboard at our workstation. And now if you were to come over to Building 30 and look, the dispatchers and call takers have eight screens and there's something happening at all times on each one of those screens. It's a real life video game, okay? It's real life. 
So we are currently in the process of working with IT and we are upgrading our current copper line, telephone line infrastructure, and we will be moving to an IP-based phone system sometime towards the end of June of this year. And with this change, it's going to allow for better call routing and accuracy on those cell phone calls that we do receive. So prior to the change from copper line to the IP base system, we're going to upgrade our current Vesta phone system, which is the computerized phone system that the call takers currently use today. And moving to an upgraded phone system will bring many new enhancements and capabilities to include take home call taking kits and dispatch kits. By expanding our call taking abilities with take home kits, it will allow an extension of call taking from the routine brick and mortar that we're all accustomed to, to allow employees the opportunity to work from home and answer 911 calls and dispatch our fire and EMS partners. We learned of this during COVID-19 from the city of Alexandria, when everyone was told everybody needs to go home and work, their director needed a way to ensure that she was still able to provide the critical service of 911 while keeping her employees safe. So she taxed her administrative staff and they have had a successful program since the onset of COVID. What the take home kits will also do for the city of Virginia Beach is there are days when maybe you just don't feel well to come to the building, but maybe you could still work from home. It's gonna reduce our unscheduled leave. And it's also gonna help us during those high call volume times when our queues go way up, instead of having to call someone and try and get them in, if you're already at home and your system's set up, you can quickly log in and help us to decrease that call volume fairly quickly. So the other initiatives that I've had underway since last year, and I know many of you weren't with us last year on council, but when I came to council last year, we were, we were in a pretty bad, we were in a critical staffing situation. We had 42 vacancies when I came last year, and 25 of those were at the public safety telecommunicator um, job description. So since that time, we have been able to decrease our vacancies from 42 to 14. Um, as you'll see on the screen, for public safety emergency telecommunicator, we currently have eight vacancies. Last year, this time, we had 25. We currently have a requisition open, and we're hoping to fill those eight vacancies. Under the master public safety emergency telecommunicator, we have four vacancies, but those positions are on hold for the upcoming watch desk. Um, we have one operations supervisor, which is brand new because we just promoted a senior operations supervisor out of that role. And then we have our 311 call taker three. We had one retired today or on the first, so we need to fill her position. As I tell many people, working and filling vacancies has been a primary goal for myself and my leadership team. However, when you are fully staffed or when I come before this body to tell you that we're fully staffed, it still takes us a great amount of time to train our new hires. We currently have 49 new employees, all at various stages in their training from the classroom to on the job training. Last year, we hired two new recruiters who were hired to assist with recruitment, public education, and outreach. These ladies have been instrumental in helping us to close this void and to bring in a high caliber of workforce for Virginia Beach Emergency Communications and Citizen Services. As I stated before, we've struggled since 2014 to fill our vacancies, but with the support of this body through the utilization of hiring bonuses and retention bonuses, we've been able to retain our current staff and bring in new staff. And for that, I thank you and I look forward to your continued support. 
And in closing, I would like to tell you all that beginning this Saturday starts National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week. Um, we're kicking off the week in the city of Suffolk with our regional telecommunicators banquet, which we've not held since COVID. So our internal staff um, that have been selected by their peers will be recognized in front of our region on Saturday evening. And Mr. Mayor will be over to visit with us on Wednesday to read the proclamation. Thank you. You have really impressed me these past few years when you've come forward. And today, you've really done it by, by closing that gap on, on the workforce that you have. Because I think one thing we have come to realize is that the people in this department also are first responders and are so yes. critical to a part of it. And I'm, I'm glad we've been able to elevate that. On the 311. Yes. Several, I lose track of time. Several years ago, we did away with 31149, but then we reinstated it primarily to, at first, to answer the questions dealing with short term rentals. Mm -hmm. But I think it's been broadened to go back more to information rather than just short term rentals. Is that correct? That is correct. So now your 311 is kind of like it used to be. It's a, it's a, it's the hub for city information. So when citizens have questions, need directions, 311 assist the real estate assessor's office in processing their calls. They assist public utilities, customer service office in assisting them with their calls for service. Um, they also handle online requests. They handle all the towing that is done for the city. Um, they handle after hours, public utility, public utilities, public works and building maintenance needs. And then they also handle emails for the city and walk-ins. So they're busy. Yes. So they're back open 24 by seven. Good. That's, that's good to know. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Hey, anyone else? Yep. Yeah, Sabrina. Thank you. Thank you for your phenomenal leadership. Thank you. Um, I'm glad you brought up the sign on bonuses and the quarterly appreciation bonuses, because that's what I was going to ask you about. Um, I would imagine the quarterly appreciation bonuses um, really do help with morale. Yes, ma'am. Would you like to speak to that or? Sure, I can if you'd like me to. Um, so, you know, because we were so short staffed, the police dispatchers are taking 911 calls. They work mandatory overtime on top of 12 hour, four 12 hour shifts a week. Um, so when I was able to go back to them and tell them that this body had approved um, appreciation bonuses for them, they were at a loss for words. They were so appreciative that their hard work and dedication is recognized by city leadership. And that is so important to them. And, and although, you know, some people might say, you know, well, it's part of their job, but when you're doing the work in a critical situation of two to three people while keeping our public safety responders safe and doing our very best to make sure everybody goes home at the end of the night, um, that appreciation bonus goes a long way. And my staff, as long as, as well as myself and my leadership team are very appreciative of that. And it has truly helped us to retain our current staff. So, I mean, I've lost a couple people along the way who found work from home jobs and that type of thing. And, you know, I can't compete with that yet, but I'm working on it with take home kits. And just a real quick follow up. Mm -hmm. um, this is, I would think, um, a also would be a booster for morale. It's something that I learned about um, some time ago, but as you mentioned, um, your team uh, is the first first responders. You yes, are the first to receive those calls. So in that interest, um, having you may have to help me with this, okay. but aligning your job duties with your title, mm -hmm. that is something that needs to be considered. And so um, I, I learned about that, and it's something that I would like this body to look at is really aligning and bringing um, 
your title, um, and I and I don't know if it's a I can't remember is it if it's a specific one, but the title that you do um, and you operate in needs to be um, uh, aligned and, uh, for lack of a better word, re re um, assigned or renamed. Okay. So that it reflects what you really do. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Well, we, we did a little bit of that. We used to be called communications officers okay. many years ago. And in the early 2000s, we did rename um, the, the, the roles and responsibilities of the 911 division. So we moved from communications officer to public safety emergency telecommunicator. Okay. public safety emergency call taker, mm-hmm. master public safety emergency telecommunicator. So we tried to align with um, what their roles and responsibilities are because we are a part of the public safety mm-hmm. infrastructure here in the city. And I have excellent chiefs that I work with that respect the work that's done in Building 30 they understand the importance of the work that's done in Building 30, and um, they have shown support for us even at Capitol Hill to get us reclassified okay. to public that's safety. That's what I yes. was Reclassification. Reclassification. So we're still working on that okay. at the state level. Um, our trade organizations are working on that. We've hired a lobbyist this past year. Unfortunately, we weren't successful but we're going to keep pushing forward until we can re- reach that goal. Okay. Thank That's our ultimate goal. I appreciate you uh, clarifying that. Yes. Me. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I just want to say especially thank you for everything you do. Uh, you know, certainly when we talk about being among the safest cities in the country, you are definitely part of the team, you know, that is really involved. And I always tr- mention, you know, out in public that you are definitely part of what goes on. And, you know, the timeliness, the expectations, and also the stress levels of what your folks have to go when, especially to navigate, you know, uh, maybe multiple departments to get there in a timely fashion to assess a problem and determine what's needed. You know, you are truly, uh, you know, God gifted uh, professionals. And uh, thank you so much for making us a great and safe city. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much. And before our next group goes on, I think it's important to note that overall across the country, the, the vacancy rate for 911 centers, the retention rate is less than 50 percent. Under Jada's leadership, the past couple of years she's been able to do this, her retention rate is over 67. A little over 67 percent. She's been doing an amazing job. Yep. Michael. <laughs> Maybe the manager can answer it. I'm sorry, I should have asked this before. I'm going to hold up this whole proceeding. When someone calls a police non emergency number, does that go to your? Does that go to the same office? Yes, it does. So it the does. same individuals that answer your nine one one call also answer the ten digit dial seven five seven three five five thousand. Yes, they're the same individuals. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, members of council, at this time, um, Chief. And acting interim chief, Chief Nadelka will come and present EMS's budget. afternoon. Um, let me just echo, please, what Jada was talking about. Her 911 dispatchers and her whole office does an exceptional job. We can't go anywhere without them. And not only do they give us the initial dispatch, they continually update us as we are responding. So we either add response units or we take away response units. They do an exceptional job. I have sat next to them more than once, and I can't do that job. So I'm very happy for, for her and her staff. Uh, Mayor Dyer, Vice Mayor Wilson, Council Member 
Honorable Council Members, Mr. Dehaney and Mr. Stiles. Um, good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity to present the FY24 budget proposal for the Department of Emergency Medical Services. You know, it takes many people to run EMS. And although I stand here as your interim EMS chief, I'm backed up by a great team, including the operational medical director, Dr. Stuart Martin. EMS is a combined service with a base of 10 volunteer rescue squads and a volunteer marine rescue team and a cadre of career medics and officers who are out there 24 seven who respond to more than 53,400 calls for service in 2022. In the audience today, there are some of those career and volunteer providers and I would be remiss if I didn't give them a shout out and say thank you very much for being here and supporting me for this. Um, they are a representation of the dedicated men and women who have answered their call for public service, much in the same way, way each and every one of you has also answered your call to public service. And like the work you all do, their impact on the community is felt every day. I want to also thank Kevin Katie and especially our analyst Alex from the Budget Office for helping us out in the past couple of months. And finally, the support and guidance from City Manager Haney, Deputy City Manager uh, Chandler and their staff has been invaluable to my leadership team and especially to me as we've navigated the past few months. Slide. <clears throat> thank you for that. EMS is divided into seven divisions we have four division chiefs. Our proposed budget for FY24 brings a will bring the department with your support up to 165.12 FTEs. There are about three, 275 to 305 active certified volunteer attendants in charge, which equates to about 63 FTEs. But given the nature of our, our service, uh, the volunteer attendants in charge number fluctuates from day to day and from month to month. We have about 210 volunteers that are in support roles, and we have 185 as students or interns that are in what we call the pipeline. Slide. While the overall budget for FY24 is 22325304 I wish to point out that about 12.4% of that budget is passed through funding. Just over $2 million will pay to contracted vendor for lifeguard services at the oceanfront. A requested grant that we support for $700,000 is included to help the Rescue Council with escalating costs for equipment and supplies. And of special note, ambulances that were ordered in 2021 cost approximately $275,000 then. However, one of our rescue squads recently received a shocking quote for a new ambulance. Not only is the production taking about 36 months from order date, the quote was for an astonishing $395,000 or a sticker shock increase of 44% that must be paid by the rescue squads. I want to say many thanks to LJ and his professionals at the city garage who do an exceptional job of maintaining the safety of our ambulance fleet even as they are faced with supply chain and other problems and delays. Finally, a pass through to our volunteer rescue squads continue with $55,000 for the ever increasing event standbys. That leaves a non pass through budget of just over $19.5 million. Slide. On this slide, I just want to point out two things for you, please. The first figures uh, in red are allocated uh, to other programs by the budget office to better align with how the department operates. And secondly, the line for emergency response program indicates an increase in FTEs for, with your support that's proposed for F. Y24. I'll explain the importance of that increase as I continue. Slide. It has been almost 20 years since Council uh, hired its first career field providers, and call volume has skyrocketed since then, but staffing has thus not kept up to pace. Over the decades, the department has recovered from many setbacks that affected staffing, but like much of the country, we have not fully recovered from the lasting effects of the invisible virus called COVID-19. The department is not immune to the local and national trends of staffing challenges either and the decline um, in volunteerism. Actually, new applications for membership are down over 30% since 2019. The goal for a city of our size is to achieve one ambulance for 3,000 calls of service. We're not close. We are about... We are approximately one ambulance per 4,849 calls for service. That affects arrival times for an ambulance and exceeds our goals, and that puts a press, additional pressure and stress on our providers. 
The result for our career professionals is that almost every scheduled 12 hour shift becomes 14, 15, and sometimes even more. And our volunteers also are affected by the excess demands. The work-life balance is out of balance and provider mental health and burnout are critical issues. Last year, over 10, just over 10% of the time an ambulance was not immediately available when a call was dispatched. Although first responders from the fire department and from in many cases the police department along with medics and supervisors when available responded to provide skilled care. There are often long delays for ambulance arrivals but all in all, the pressures of the situation have caused some volunteers and career personnel to go on leave to take a mental break, and some actually have just exited the service altogether. Our FY24 budget request for additional staffing is a vital part of our entire strategy to address staffing needs, as I will continue to uh, review in the next slides. Next slide, please. <clears throat> During last summer's hiring efforts, we discovered that the pool of certified paramedics is much smaller than in the past. Consequently, we were asking for only 10 new paramedic positions. However, with the expanded training and treatment protocols now available for advanced EMTs, we are seeking 20 new AEMT positions. Plus, we're asking for eight additional captains to bring the span of control to a much more reasonable level. Currently, our field captains are responsible for sometimes up to 15 providers during a shift, and that's in addition to handling resource allocations, responding to calls, quality assurance reports, and volunteer and career personnel matters and issues. The standard for effective span of control is about five to seven. The additional captains will improve resource management and scene supervision, among others. As a collateral benefit, the additional captains will help to free up supervisors from the fire department who also sometimes respond when an EMS officer is not readily available or is on a delay. That causes them to not be available immediately for their calls. We are asking for a full-time recruiter. With career vacancies and Rescue Squad Foundation's $1.1 million recruitment campaign, we want to help that to be a resounding success. But we cannot do that effectively when we have it as a third or fourth collateral responsibility for a staff member at the office. Last year, we expanded our EMT training by adding additional EMT classes plus classes on Saturdays to provide more options for our new volunteer members. We recently graduated all 19 volunteers from our first advanced EMT Academy, and I'm proud to say that that success of the first academy has put us much closer to adding advanced EMT training to the department's list of accreditations. We also adapted our hiring process in our career academies to adjust for the issue with the staffing and the availability of paramedics. We went from one career uh, medic, uh, one career academy to four academies. Next slide, please. We have a great team of dedicated individuals focused on providing excellent patient care as they did more than 53,000 times last year. And in fact, last year EMS achieved the, bless you, EMS achieved uh, the American Heart Association's Mission Lifeline Gold Plus Award. That's important because it is their highest de designation for successful cardiac arrest survivals by an agency. And it wasn't just us. It was teamwork with police, fire, 911 dispatchers, our volunteers and career providers, and often bystander CPR that got us to that recognition. The Burton Station Fire Station EMS facility recently came to fruition and we'll have staffing there 24 seven, assigned there 24 seven. Your EMS department was selected as the first ground transport agency in Tidewater to pilot the whole blood program. What does that mean? We now have the capability to provide the highest level of life-saving care to trauma patients that we didn't just prior in prior years. Our collaboration with Eastern Virginia Medical School has resulted in the expansion of their resident physician and physician assistant credentialing programs. Plus, we are Virginia's only EMS agency with an on-duty physician program. Although currently a collateral responsibility, EMS continues our teamwork with Dr. Padati and Public Health with ongoing communication with the State Office of EMS to develop and implement a community mobile integrated healthcare program. Building upon our success at the Mass Vaccination Clinic, this MIH program will bring healthcare education and risk reduction into the community to meet our health equity objectives. We are also working with our other healthcare providers to improve the effectiveness of the crisis intervention team. 
We continue working with Russia Council's ambassadors program to help move through new members through the system. EMS is just not ambulances anymore. We are so much more. As I, as I, and I extend an invitation to each and every one of you to come take a ride along with us for a few hours. You'll get a first-hand look at your, at your combined EMS team and the entire emergency response system in action in closing. The women, and, the women and men who make up the combined Department of Emergency Medical Services are some of the most compassionate and skilled providers you will ever meet. But the ever-increasing call volume does place an added burden of stress on all our providers. And as much as possible, our field providers, providers field officers, sorry, work at least to give them as much as possible a break when call volume allows. Our members and stakeholders are encouraged by our strategy to get additional ambulances staffed per shift, along with dedicated support for recruitment. I have said there are people who are the best, but others are saying that too. Last year, three of our providers, one was one of our volunteers, received regional awards from the Tidewater EMS Council. The city's 2022 year in review webpage, EMS is featured in the Healthy City section three times for our accomplishments. And finally, the department recently received a handmade greeting card from a fifth grader who wrote us and said, quote, thank you for all you do for the community, and we love you all. I can't beat that. I can say a lot, but I can't beat that. Thank you again for this opportunity. I look for your support, um, and, and I recognize, again, thank you for letting me to recognize our people who are out there 24-7, regardless of weather or hazard, to help care for all the types of medical and other emergencies out there. Thank you very much. I'm ready for okay, questions. Rocky, and then Rosemary. Chief, I see a lot of your folks out there. If you could stand up and just identify yourself, if you're here with the chief for the presentation today, if you could go ahead and stand up. You got a good crowd with you, and we appreciate everything you do. Absolutely. Good job. Thank you. Thank you, so, sir. Chief, I have a question for you. On one of the slides, about the ambulances. My question is, how many ambulances uh, ambulances do we need in our city, and, and how, how close are we to staffing those needs for the ambulances? It's an excellent question. Thank you, sir. I think you may have extra slides in your packet, and if you go to slide number 16, uh, I think you have slide number 16. We have a prepared uh, table that shows um, ambulance staffing comparisons from around the country and also around locally. On average, we have about 11 or so ambulances. Now, that does fluctuate from time to time, but it's on average, sometimes less, especially at shift change, especially in the uh, um, shift change times and early morning, and sometimes more, especially on weekends where we have a better strength on the volunteers. So right now, we're at about 11. We should be at 18 um, during the day minimum, and at night, probably 15, but 18 can fluctuate with a with a, a demand shift or something, if we get additional staffing to try to work those numbers in. Does that answer, sir? Yes, sir, it does, thank okay. you, sir. Thank you. Hey, anybody else? Okay, Rosemary, Barbara, and then uh, Maria. We are so lucky to have the largest volunteer service in the country, and this has been going on for decades, and we can't thank the volunteers and for what all they do to raise the money for the ambulances and staffing. And, and last year, uh, I forgot how many, but Mr. Duhaney, you, you wanted to put in some of these people last year. Is that, you, how many? It was 20. 20. And, and we held off to see if we could do it with the resources of volunteers, but we can't even hire people for money. It's, it's, sometimes it's really hard to get people to volunteer. So there's just a shortage in all, everywhere. And so uh, this is a life and death thing, whether somebody gets there timely or not. Uh, it could be a difference between their quality of life or if they make it or not. So this is, you know, we talked about wants and needs. This is definitely a need. We have got to do this. This is a need. We have to make sure that our citizens feel safe. If you don't, how many times I've said, if you, if you don't feel safe, you don't have anything. So... This is definitely a need, and I, and I thank you for putting it forward. And thank you and the volunteers and, and, and the staff and all that you do. You really can keep the city going. Thank you. Okay, Barbara and Amelia. 
Well, I know that uh, this is probably one of the departments that has the biggest gap, uh, and that's shown in the new positions. And being an add-on into the budget kind of makes it in a vulnerable position because the easy thing is to just cut out all the new stuff uh, when we don't want to have a, a higher tax payment. But this is one of those new things that, uh, as, as Rosemary said, is so critical. Uh, and, and I guess we can kind of look at the fact that everybody lost volunteers during the pandemic, and that's the time you all needed folks the most and so forth. But clearly, in, in looking at, at what we need, able to provide the number of ambulances that would be necessary, are necessary, and staff, because of course it also eats into the other public safety departments as well when you don't have what you need because they're out there filling in those gaps as well. And so I think we really have to, to look at what you're saying here. Um, and I guess maybe we don't do enough to let folks know the value of having this volunteer system means that when you call an ambulance in Virginia Beach, you don't get a bill for it. And so it, there's quite a difference, a, a, quite a value, uh, literally, to people who, and that's all of us, because we know you're there whenever we need you. I think we maybe have not done enough to promote the volunteerism aspect of this, and maybe that's something within the next two or three weeks we need to do more of, uh, because uh, this is certainly a, um, a department that is um, in need right now, uh, because we really uh, are asking our volunteers to do a tremendous amount, and, and you all do so much. Somehow or other, we've got to find a way to make sure that this is not the most vulnerable thing in this budget uh, when we're looking at it. So I appreciate that. But I really think it might be a good thing for us to uh, determine if we had to go to a paid service, what would the fee be? What would we be charging? I think it's pretty substantial. And I think that figure maybe needs to be out there for, public, for the public to understand. Amelia? Um, first of all, well, I wanted to thank you for having graduated all 19 in that class, because sometimes people start, but you have people drop off. Yeah, well, I'm very and proud of that. Yeah. You did a great job. And the second thing, are there any of the Burton Station I'm sorry? people among us from Burton Station area? Actually, Burton Station will be an assignment that will rotate day to day to have at least one ambulance there, possibly right. two. Um, as they as they progress with that building, but we it is open on the fire side now. We have availability being outside to service that northwest corridor. Yes, because I was happy you opened at eight o'clock, and by nine o'clock, you're out there serving people. I'm District Four, and I was just so excited to our see fire that. Department, our fire department did a great job putting people in there, yeah. and then just and then Jada must have seen the clock and say, "Okay, it's one hour. You guys gonna get a call." So yeah. done. So please pass that along to them. I sure Thank will. You. Barbara brought up a very good point that yes. people in our city, when they call, they don't have to worry about paying that bill for the ambulance, and, and that could also save lives, too. And in the other cities, some of you may not be aware, but if you don't pay the bill they send you, they put a lien on your house. I've, I've had closings. <coughs> yes, I've had closings. One of our sister cities that they couldn't close until they paid the lien off from the ambulance that the man's wife went to the hospital and didn't make it. He didn't pay the bill. So it's it's something it, it has a lot of ramifications to having to pay that bill. Yeah. Anybody else? Chris? Thanks for coming today. You're welcome, sir. Directly, um, when you did you state that the lack of ambulances or the <clears throat> the sheer number we have is impacting your ability to recruit and retain volunteers? The, the, the current think, trend that's out there. I think I'll, I'll take that. I think, um, 
I think it's important to, to note that the volunteer um, squads and the volunteer foundation, they've done a tremendous amount of putting extra dollars and extra resources towards marketing and, um, and recruitment. And they're developing a pipeline and we're starting to see that pipeline, but it takes a long time to train um, those um, volunteers before they actually hit the street. I think what um, the issue that we're struggling with is that while that pipeline is being nurtured and developed and trained, the calls for services are going up dramatically and the career staff and the volunteers are just burning out because they're meeting that demand, right? So I, I wouldn't necessarily say that that's um, causing a recruitment issue, but I think, sir, to your point, it is causing a retention issue because until the, the volunteers get there and we get the additional career staff support, we're continuing to ask a tremendous amount of volunteers and career staff that's continuing to put the burnout on them. So. Mm -hmm. From the average, you, you need to be at 18, we're at 11. That's Did right. I hear that yes, correctly? Sir. Yes, sir. So is there an ask in this budget for any additional vehicles, ambulances? Uh, no, the vehicle, the actually ambulances are owned by the volunteers. Um, and we have, we haven't, when they're all fixed when, with parts, we have sufficient ambulances to cover that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, anybody else? <coughs> yeah, Josh. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and to the Vice Mayor's point, I can chime in and let you know uh, it is thousands of dollars to ride in the back of an ambulance, um, not just because I'm a klutz, but um, but because when I was younger, um, you know, somebody somebody came into our high school or into our middle school gymnasium and sprayed some mace, and because I had asthma, um, it affected me pretty severely. And because I grew up with a single mom, I I, I was nervous about actually getting in the ambulance because that was it, it scared me more than the physical condition itself did. So, um, thank you all for coming and uh, to our aid and rescue, no matter what. And we appreciate you being here, um, you know, just more than you possibly know. Thank you. Thank you. And if I can make a, a personal note, uh, Worth and I had the uh, privilege of attending the graduation last week of uh, some of the fine folks that you, you are, you know, producing. They were just wonderful and motivated. And if I could just tell a quick personal story, uh, I was doing home care physical therapy for a number of years. And I was working on a remarkable young man in his early 40s. He had a you know little problem walking, but basically what happened was he went and went into cardiac arrest. And he was in prolonged cardiac arrest for I think about a half an hour. And they didn't give up and they pulled him through. And what was remarkable, he, he was a father of nine children. And the other thing is the wife had in her purse a list of every fireman and EMS that participated and saved this guy's life. What you folks do are save lives. So, you know, just a little bit of a personal story. There. Thank you for that, sir. Appreciate okay, it. Okay, thank you all. All right, Mr. Mayor, members of council at this time. Fire Chief Ken Pravitz will provide will present the fiscal year 24 budget for the fire department. Hey, hey, how hey, you doing? Good afternoon. How's everybody today? Doing good. Good. Thanks for the opportunity to discuss our budget with you. Uh, the fire department, as you know, is an all hazards response agency. We're excellent in what we do, and our mission is to protect life and property. And uh, we really appreciate the support we get from city council and city manager Duhaney. It, uh, it helps us at the top of our spear in uh, serving the citizens. So thank you very much for that. I know I was told to be brief, so I'm going to try and roll through this. The department has seen a steady increase in uh, mandatory overtime. We just contracted a staffing study. And I fully expect it will show we're about 100 FTEs short. We submitted uh, for 15 positions in this budget, nine to continue achieve four-person staffing, and three to increase my research and planning staff, uh, and also three FTEs for battalion accountability and safety technicians. And you'll see in the, uh, in the proposed budget, that's a plus of three FTEs for the fire department this year. 
This is a snapshot of our budget. The majority of our budget, 91% of it, is uh, related to salaries and benefits. 6% is internal service charges and leases, leaving about 2.7% for discretionary funding. Projected in uh, FY23, the FEMA cooperative agreement, you'll see $661,000. Uh, that's only partial of it. That's for the building and the lease, uh, the rent and personnel costs related with the FEMA program. We will get the rest of that grant when Congress formalizes how much they're going to give this year for the FEMA program, the Urban Search and Rescue program. And then also you'll see uh, $1.8 million in the ATL grant. That is what we receive from the state through insurance premiums offsets for the fire department to help us with training and equipment. This is the um, breakdown of the budget as I just mentioned. You can see the departments and divisions. Uh, we have consists of operations, administration, training, fire prevention, or we call community risk reduction and the FEMA program. And uh, that's how it breaks out. Major changes and in initiatives. We submitted um, a request for $368,000 to sustain the cancer screening. Uh, cancer is the number one health risk to the firefighters right now. It used to be cardiac related, but we're seeing cancer uh, increasing significantly in our workforce. And we, uh, we requested some money to sustain the cancer. We have approval to do a department-wide cancer screening this year, and we were looking for funding to con continue that support uh, going forward. The next initiative I mentioned earlier is the Battalion Accountability and Safety Technicians. This budget funds three of those. We need tw a total of 12 to outfit every battalion. The, um, these employees are critical to our risk reduction. Uh, acting as assistants to the INSA commander, battalion chiefs supervise about 40 employees, and the aides assist in emergency response, staffing, administration, management, incident command, and uh, they're an important part of uh, keeping the community and the citizens and the workforce safe. The major changes, this is our planning and research. One of our requests was to increase our capabilities to plan, analyze, and predict. We requested three FTEs, but the, the none are in the proposed budget. We use data in our department. The example on the right, our planning and research team has developed comprehensive dashboards to evaluate our response and our performance. This includes performance stat and rescue stat. We have two non-sworn uh, employees that work in that shop, and uh, we would uh, support some additional staffing for that. On the left, you'll see a map. We do a lot of GIS mapping. This map is a sample of us predicting where we can reach our response time goals. You can see areas that are not covered by a color or areas where we have gaps in our predicted coverage. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we're putting a Lansdowne fire station in our plans for the future. Deployment of our resources is very dynamic and we're constantly adjusting to make sure that we're meeting the needs and having the GIS specialist to help us with that uh, is a big part of our business. So uh, our mission is to protect life and property. This includes our staff. We need additional staffing. As I mentioned, we're working on a staffing study, and we'll see what the results are, and certainly we'll get that shared with you as soon as we receive it. Um, but we do need to provide some relief to our employees. In addition, you'll hear the public safety departments are all talking about psychological services. We need to psychological services to so a contract. We're working through that. We had a couple conversations with Oc Health and uh, purchasing yesterday about that, but we do need to get that psychological services contract completed and take, taken care of. We need a, cl a clinician who understands our business. The average citizen deals with death six to eight times in a lifetime. Our people see, see and deal with death uh, every day of their work, the trauma that they deal with. One of our employees that has been out in the field for less than a year just told me the other day that he's done CPR more than 60 times since he's been out in the field. Um, so there is a real need to deal with that stress of the work, the, the work that we're asking our people to do. And, uh, oops, sorry. I know that uh, it will be discussed in LJ's Hansen budget, but the proposed increase investment in our facilities is, a, is a critical to our success. There's, a, there's an increase in the facilities line in LJ's budget that we use to take care of our facilities. I have 25 facilities that we're maintaining. I have facilities that uh, do not have adequate showers for females. I have facilities that don't have separate locker and bunk space. 
And I know that's a big part of making our employees feel welcome and belong. So I do appreciate the proposed budget increasing that line so we can make some of those adjustments to our facilities. And finally, the increase to the fire apparatus CIP is also in uh, LJ's budget. The uh, fire apparatus, as you heard, the cost of ambulances are going up, fire trucks are no different, and the lead times and the delivery times are significant. It's a major gap, and uh, I predict that if we don't get ahead of it in about two years, we're gonna be really struggling to put apparatus on the street. So uh, the uh, last apparatus that we asked for is 27 month delivery time, so. I know I've uh, thrown a lot at you in very short time. We truly appreciate the support from the city council. We have an excellent fire department. I'm really proud of the men and women in our department and the service they deliver. And uh, I'm willing to take any questions now that you may have in the fire department. Michael. Thank you. Chief. Thank you. I wish I could make comments like probably we all do in response to every presentation we hear because we've heard such really incredible presentations from really outstanding public safety professionals and city public servants so far. Um, so I've been trying to hold my tongue a little bit for the sake of time and out of respect for everyone else's time. But I do want to say something about the fire department, and I also do have a question. Um, Chief, as you know, I had the privilege, really, of being on a ride along mm -hmm. just last Friday mm -hmm. with um, a number of firefighters from Station 16. And um, it's just really, I think, many people who see fire trucks on the road and Passed by a fire station, just don't have a sense of the depth and breadth, depth and breadth of the professionalism that um, your team embarks upon every single day. Because I saw, um, Pete, I saw folks. Fortunately, there was no fire on the shift that I rode along on. So you might but, be good luck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm willing to go on more, um, but uh, but I did see people preparing for fire. For, for just a you know fire alarm mm -hmm. that probably was a false alarm, but preparing the same level of seriousness with which you might expect if there was just a major fire event going on with all kinds of things, heavy duty equipment. But then I saw the firefighters respond to an adult with disabilities and, and then approach that individual who's having a really bad day mm -hmm. with a gentleness, compassion, and then turn that case over to the EMS providers when a seamless transition that the patient didn't even realize or know about. It was just amazing. Just really incredible to see um, that just the scope of all of the things that your team faces in the sh and in the same time, training at the station mm -hmm. and, and um, getting out all kinds of equipment I've never seen or heard of before, and then running the, extending the ladder to make, you know, whatever they were doing, just working constantly in service to the people of Virginia Beach. And I just want to tell you, it was incredible. And, and I think citizens could participate in ride-alongs if they were interested in, or interested in serving in the fire service, and council members certainly can, and I encourage you to do it. I encourage you to do it so you could see up close and personal just what these men and women professionals go through in the course of their shift. And then long-term, and we know what the long-term health effects can be in sacrifice, so I just... You know, hats off you. to you and your team. Um, it's unbelievable, really. So the the um, question I have, though, is related to Station 16 particularly um, had uh, con contemplation around changing the engine crew from three to four. Mm -hmm. And I have a couple of questions about that. No, it wasn't included in the budget proposal. And it's a tight year. Mm -hmm. we, we all acknowledge that. Um, and so I'm not here to second guess that decision. But I, I would like to better understand what what that would mean for for the citizens and also what that would mean for the fire crew, mm -hmm. just for the for that for the crew on the engine, but also for the crew at, at the stations. So so if you could provide more context yeah, about that. Quick... But then yeah. but then in addition to that, um, what, um, oh, sorry, I forgot, lost my train of thought. It'll come to me, probably right after you leave the podium. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, Council Member Belushi. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, Council Member Belushi, before Chief Prophets, um goes, Mr. Belushi, 
I know um, I don't have any problems um, if council second guesses, right? That's basically the point of the proposed budget is for the manager to make a um, proposal and council to consider it. So if council feels like we should go in a different direction, by all means, that's the purpose of this to deliberate. I know your intent. I know what you meant, but I just want to make sure I clarify that as well. Okay. Like, I'm open to it. It's the job. It's what we do to create the deliberation so council can make it their budget when they adopt it. All right, well, then let me offer clarifying remarks. I'm not second guessing, but I'd like more information about why that decision was made and also um, what it would mean for. So I did remember what I was saying. What, what will it mean for the citizens? But also, if you're approximately 100 FTEs down, would you even be able to fill those positions if council authorized them? That was my other part of my question. Well, it's, we are catching up on our FTEs. We were behind. We uh, we were authorized for 21 over hires in the last hire. Um, thank you, Council uh, City Manager in Haiti, for approving that. But we um, we are caught up. Essentially, we are at full strength right now. The problem is I have 50 people in training or in some form of training, just like you heard from Jada. So they're not people out on fire trucks. So that it would take a while to get people on fire trucks. As it takes us about a year to get through the hiring and training process. But the four-person staffing, it makes the crew more efficient. It makes it safer. They're sharing the workload. It also allows us to change the, uh, the calculations for our effective response force so that we're achieving our effective response force sooner because we can get the, the number of people we need to handle a structure fire quicker by having let the first four apparatus reach it instead of having waited until the fifth or sixth apparatus get there. So it increases our effective response force. It increases our coverage for the rest of the city because we can change our response, not have to bring so many apparatus to the scene. We can leave some others available, so it increases the coverage. So over and over, all in all, it would improve our response. It would make it safer for the firefighters on duty. It would make it safer for the citizens. And then when we're handling an EMS inc incident, you know, the extra hands, certainly CPR on a, on a an event takes more than just one or two people. It takes a crew of four or five people. Like we just did a, a massive in-service where we did pit crew CPR and everybody had a piece of it. So it just makes everything function more efficiently. So. And, and follow up. I know station 16 was one of those. What, are, what were the, there were a number of other things, two or three others. So I have 12 apparatus that aren't at four person staffing. It's mostly the two piece companies. So all the single piece companies are staffed at four. So that means where there's one apparatus in the fire station, all the rest of the, most of the two piece companies are where we would target next. Two pieces, a ladder. And so when there's an engine and a ladder together, those are usually staffed with three. Yeah. So there's many, there's 12. There's 12. So it's 42 people to get four person staffing. Would, would it be, sorry, Mayor, would it be possible to provide incremental increases in that? Yeah, we've been working on four-person staffing for about 20 years, and we've been just trying to get whenever we can get a couple people. Yeah, it's been a while. So we had, back when the cigarette tax was passed and there was some money appropriated, we were going to try and put four, you know, TAC apparatus a little individually to get four-person staffing. We've just never completed it. So. Thank you. Barbara? Well, that four-person per... Truck or whatever you want to call it, it's long been one of the things that we've worked on. But in, in adding three people in the uh, battalion assistance, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a pretty critical thing. Too. Yes, ma'am. I can't yeah. imagine these battalion chiefs riding up the trying to do all the stuff they have to do. So I guess you just have to decide whether the new people are better there than right yeah it's a risk reduction calculation and the, the battalion chief trying to drive respond to an emergency reading the map um, talking on two radios and understanding what's going on on the incident that they're responding to to take command of just having that aid and assistant uh, is a huge help and it takes away the risk of the driving hazard when they're trying to focus on five other things how so. many how many are there and so we're, we're a so we have five battalions and we have three shifts so there'd be a total of 15 but we've got three people last year and this budget proposes another three so there'd be another nine after that okay. that's good i just wondered how far we were from achieving that goal because i mean we have two needs here and, and they're just competing with each other uh, but I, I really uh do think as far as the the new ad the cancer screening is yes. critical because early detection is critical. And now we're finding out how susceptible our firefighters are. And mm -hmm. so I certainly want to see that stay in. But I'll also pass along what I've been hearing from the people in West Neck, how much they appreciate the response that the fire department did to the fire yep. four weeks ago today. Mm -hmm. And we did 
a great job. Yes, they did. Yep. I can't imagine if it had been in the middle of the night and they hadn't been there on time. But enhance that on, please. Yes, I will. The uh, fire is actually from the West Neck, and our drone uh, got up overhead and was able to give us information on where to put our resources. So it got us ahead of it. I yeah. thought that's what it was. Yes, that's, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Amelia? Yeah, I just had two quick things. Um, for education, I was so pleased to see at Diamond Springs Elementary mm -hmm. where you have the pre-K up the first grade 500. And when I went to visit, they were practicing all of their drills, mm -hmm. pretend curtains, how to crawl under. And you had volunteers who had were veterans who are giving their time. They have enjoyed being 32 years, I think, mm -hmm. Jeff Floyd. Jeff Floyd, yeah. Yeah, yep, you yeah. know, and there he was, busy helping all these little rug rats yeah. getting through. So yeah. that was really amazing to see. Yeah. Thank you. And then one quick question. When you mentioned about psychological services, yeah. and which is crucial, are you all working at all with the Department of Health for now? The like health, some of that? Well, not for our internal customers. I don't think we've worked with the Department of Health um, for our, our members. Uh, we certainly work with the Department of Health for external service and working with the community and the needs in the community. But for, for the fire department personnel, we're working with occupational health and legal and, and the city HR to try and cover up the gap. And actually, we're exploring uh, converting current contracts to try and add some more services. Yes, that is important. Thank you for sharing. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? But, you know, Kenny, Ken, let me just say, God bless you guys. I think that you deserve the national recognition for excellence that you have between the fire and the, the FEMA. And if anybody hasn't seen your facility, you know, it's really, a, you know, a class uh, facility. But the thing is that people don't realize the training, the constant training that you all got for. Years ago, I went through the Citizens Fire mm -hmm. Academy way back when, and it was amazing the amount of training. And then that, that I always mention, you know, graduation speeches. When you get a call, you never know what's going to be on the other side. But you guys are, oh, and you know, your firemen and fire uh, women mm -hmm. are always ready for any contingency because of the excellence of supervision. And training that you get. Yeah, thank you. Excellent people work for the organization, excellent people in the city, and uh, I'm really proud of the work they do. Thank you. Yeah. Thank okay, you. thank you. Sorry, by the yeah. way, Mayor, Station 16 is in District 3. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, folks. Who's in District 1 these days? <laughs> All right, Mr. Mayor, members of council, at this time, Police Chief Newdegate will come and present the Police Department's um, fiscal year 24 budget. Welcome, Chief. Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of council, uh, thank you for the opportunity to come before you today. Um, I actually come bearing good news. I think the last two years I've come before this body with uh, not so great news and some heavy lifts, especially in regards to technology. So I think uh, the good news is there are no requests for technology. And I come to ask and present that uh, as we stand today, we have 46 vacancies in the police department. The last two years, I think we were talking about vacancies nearing almost 100. So we have closed that gap significantly. Of those 46, we do believe and anticipate that with our July recruit class, that we may be very close to complete authorized staffing uh, for the first time in a long time. So uh, that is great news. With that being said, we come before the body and ask. Uh, that would take us back to 788 officers. Um, I'm sorry, our authorized complement of 787. Uh, last year, we did vacate some uh, non-fillable sworn positions. Uh, you gave me at least nine positions for our real-time crime center that uh, we are on pace to stand up when we move into the new police headquarters. So we do come before the body asking to recover some of those vacated positions. And we're asking for, I believe it is 11 at this time, uh, that we can have a substantial recruit class 
um, come next January as well. And what that would allow me to do, if we have that recruit class, it will allow me to fill some of those vacancies that we have in our specialized assignments. Right now, especially special investigations, vice and narcotics have vacancies, and our traffic safety unit, and especially our motorcycle unit, have some vacancies that we think are critical to fill. Uh, the other two requests that we do have, uh, I did listen to some of the prior presentations. Um, you've heard a lot about body cameras. We talk a lot about body cameras. I know the sheriff, uh, the Commonwealth attorney, we know that uh, over the last two years that we have added approximately 350 body worn cameras for now almost 800 cameras out there in the field. We've added 200 plus uh, mobile video recorders or cameras in the cars. And we have seen what that has done for us as an organization and a city when we have critical incidents. It protects the city, it protects our officers, it gives us a more of an objective, uh, impartial view of what occurred. But that does come with some challenges like uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Stolle explained, um, the FOIA request uh, resulting from all that additional footage, we are struggling to keep up. So we are asking for two positions in the budget to help us maintain uh, the increased number. I think when you look at the, the numbers, we have almost doubled our FOIA request, and a lot of that is body-worn camera footage over the last two years. In addition, our FOIA office also took on the responsibility of doing all the background checks, and that has been approximately, I think it's 9,700. So we, we are struggling in that regards, and we would be very grateful to add some non-sworn personnel to help absorb some of those tasks and some of those were handled by sworn officers previously, and we wanna make sure that our officers wearing badges and guns are out in the community doing the things that we expect and not those administrative assignments. And the other request is we all have these little computers that we walk around with, um, treasure trove of information. We have a lot of things in there, but it is also a treasure trove of criminality. And with a lot of our investigations, especially Detective Bureau, special investigations, our crime suppression teams that focus on shooting violence, there is a big nexus between what's on that phone and our investigations and what we can prove in court and uncover additional criminality. So we need some civilian forensic examiners. I think two years ago, we did forensics examinations on 109 phones. Last year was 333. That number is going to continue to expand greatly. And that is a, a, a job that I don't think any of us want sworn officers doing when we can hire qualified civilian employees to do those forensic examinations for our detectives and give them the information that they need. And uh, I think the fire chief hit it greatly. One of the things that we are working on uh, is definitely that joint request for proposal uh, right now, it is police, fire, and 911 for us to really look at obtaining psychological services for our employees that start with pre employment, gives us an individual that is very familiar with our public safety realm, specifically policing for pre employment, fitness for duty, critical incident debriefs, um, and, and we think it's imperative. But uh, that is not a funding issue right now. But I think uh, you know what we are looking at as we move into the rest of this year, uh, major proposals, we move into our new headquarters, we stand up that real-time crime center, which will really be that 24 operations center for the police department in the city. And we believe uh, we'll be ready to have that up October, November, when we make, uh, make our move. So, and I open it up for questions. Any questions? Barbara? That real-time crime center, I'm really waiting. See, yes, ma'am. Remember that budget ask, and I thought that was uh, spot on. And also the other technology that we did at that time, the shot spotter. Yes, ma'am. I think that's been pretty highly successful. Hasn't it? It, yes, ma'am, it has. That comes with an annual re up of the contract. Is that correct? So you have that in the, in the budget. Are you expanding that? To Yes, ma'am. Council Member Hemley, we currently have two uh, coverage areas. As we know, we have uh, the Ocean Front Resort area, and we are out in Lake Edward, and uh, we are in the process right now of adding a third uh, uh, coverage area, which will be uh, 
Green Run and uh, Twin Canal covering the first and fourth precinct. Um, and we do have funding for all that. I think we are into a multi-year contract with them and it comes out of our CIP budget right now. And so that's within the budget and... Yes, ma'am. I'm not asking for any additional funds. It's already budgeted. And uh, like you, I'm very, very excited about standing up the Real-Time Crime Center for, for this city. I think uh, bringing all those technologies and this council has been very, very gracious with providing the funding to move us forward with technology. Um, I, I made no qualms that we were behind the times and we have taken great strides with the support of this council and this community over the last two years. Uh, technology is that force multiplier for us. It really had to be, especially when we were looking at the number of vacancies. But as we close that vacancy gap and we ask for those additional bodies back to do some of those proactive work, uh, coupled with the technology, the, the city is going to continue to get safer. And that is our goal. We are in a good place, but we can't rest on our laurels. I'm looking forward to seeing that. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Josh. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Chief Peter Gate. Uh, thank you for showing me around the uh, police headquarters. I really enjoyed spending the morning with you uh, recently when we did that. And I, I want to commend you and uh, just for engaging the community through this, uh, the, the CAC, the uh, Citizen Advisory Committee meetings, uh, particularly those that, that go on in the third precinct. Um, those are really well attended. Um, and, and I think Residents really appreciate uh, hearing from our public safety uh, professionals in, in terms of what's going on in their neighborhood. So I just I want to commend you and your team for engaging the community. Thank you, Councilman. And I'll use this as an opportunity for those that uh, may be watching over the next several couple of weeks. Uh, my executive team and I will be at uh, those various uh, CACs to present uh, last year's crime stats that I presented to this body not long ago. I think uh, it really shows the great work of the men and women of this department and our partnership with the community. So we wanna take that show on the road. So uh, for those that uh, may wanna hear what that looks like and what their police department's been doing, uh, we'll be out uh, in the community the next couple of weeks. Okay. Chief, thanks for making us the great you all. safe city we are. Thank you. Thanks for all your crew. Thank you. And at this time, David Tupsinski, our Director of Emergency Management, will come and pre present on the fiscal year 24 budget for emergency management. I just call them tops. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome, how are you? Got it, thank you. All right, good afternoon. I appreciate you uh, having me here to talk about emergency management and our initiatives and our proposals for FY24. Uh, as the city manager said, I'm Dave Tobzinski. I'm the emergency management coordinator and director of uh, Virginia Beach Emergency Management for the city. So emergency management, we're, uh, we're organized into two divisions. We have the emergency management division and then the security division. Uh, each division is broken down into specific program areas that have uh, their own areas of responsibility. So together we provide uh, crisis and incident management, a citywide training and exercise program, community and business outreach and engagement, emergency planning, we lead recovery operations, and we provide uh, oversight and governance for sec uh, workforce security, workplace security, critical asset protection, and then we conduct threat and hazard assessments to validate plans and make sure we're keeping the city safe and we're able to do what we say we can do. Uh, for FY24, we're proposing uh, adding six part-time security officers to enhance security here at City Hall. Um, which is the equivalent to three full-time positions uh, without benefits. So overall, our budget hasn't changed too much. Um, you'll see an increase in the security <clears throat> uh, budget. Uh, however, that's not quite an increase like it might first look. So working with budget services, we were able to do a budget transfer of $500,000 that pays for our third-party security contractor. The first year was under a CIP. So we moved it into our operating budget uh, to follow city practices have better accountability and better oversight over that. So the increase for the security budget of new funding is $85,740, uh, which is for those three full-time positions, which will be used to create six part-time positions to enhance security here uh, during the day, daytime hours. 
Overall, the, uh, our operating budget hasn't changed that much. Again, you'll see that transfer of funds from the CIP into our operating budget, and then the uh, increase for the uh, six part-time uh, security professionals, which we'll cover in a little bit more detail on the next slide for you. So this is a small snapshot of uh, everything uh, we have going on. We have a lot of initiatives across the city. We're a small and mighty department. Um, we know that the number, size, and type of incidents uh, and disasters are increasing every year. Uh, we, and unfortunately, live in a world where managing those threats, those hazards uh, for our workforce and our citizens has become part of everyday life. And uh, as Virginia's largest city, uh, we're no different. Miles and miles of coastline, tons of critical infrastructure, um, and we have to be proactive on this as we grow and develop. <clears throat> so for security, working closely with the police department to add six part-time uh, security professionals to cover normal business hours here at City Hall. Um, those will be daytime. They'll have enhanced training, and enhanced capability to manage threats and hazards that are, and any incidents that occur. Um, it's one of the most populations in the building. Our workforce is here, the public's here. So having those uh, security professionals with some extra training and accountability and oversight to answer directly to us to keep our workforce and citizens safe. What that allows our security contractor to do is to ship their uh, security professionals to evening, overnight, and weekend shifts here at City Hall and across the uh, Municipal Center complex. It's a capability they're struggling to fill right now, so we have a lot of gaps in coverage on the uh, evenings and overnights. Um, so that in total will let us have a complete security package here for the entire Municipal Center, which is critical. It's a huge hub for the city and it is full of critical infrastructure, so we want to make sure that we have a whole network of security professionals protecting um, the entire complex and our workforce during the day. Our other uh, major initiative is technology enhancements. As we know, uh, technology changes in the blink of an eye. It's been about eight years or so since we've really improved technology and how we use technology in emergency management and the Emergency Operations Center, um, the EOC. So we're working really close with IT and ECCS, Jada's team. Um, to update our technology and then really expand it. So we're moving towards a single solution that is used across departments. And the change here being that it's proactive, we're using it day to day, it's incorporated into daily activities. So when there's a large incident or a disaster, we're able to seamlessly switch to this software solution, track resources, uh, conduct planning and share critical information without any disruptions, then currently having to switch a software on, have departments switch to using an individual software, and then we're behind the eight ball trying to catch up. Um, and that, that's just really, as we move forward, integrating with police in real-time crime and ECCS to monitor and get ahead of any threats so we have as much leeway and, and lead time to prepare as, as possible. And then we're building resiliency, and we're doing that through partnerships and uh, networks and relationships. Uh, we're working with the Resort Management Office, RMO, our public safety partners, and also um, Public Works to really look at how we plan for these large special events. We're having larger and larger special events more frequently, so we're looking at how we can build relationships and not only plan for keeping the public and our event attendees safe, but also the rest of the city. So something that happens in the city doesn't impact um, the festival and something in the festival doesn't draw resources and impact the city as a whole. So we're working through those and we're growing a lot of new partnerships and rebuilding uh, after the pandemic, a lot of partnerships with the U.S. Navy, the Coast Guard, DOD, um, our communities and business partners, and then a lot of nonprofits and uh, volunteer organizations. What we know is that when there is a catastrophic incident or a disaster, <clears throat> these type of organizations come in really quickly and can provide support services almost immediately. It takes us a while to spin up and get into place. What we don't want to do is be learning about what their capabilities are during the incident. So we're building relationships, building them into emergency planning, uh, bringing them into our training and exercise program so we can get to know each other, manage expectations, and, and have them built into our plan so we can call on them and know exactly what we're getting and when. Part of that is a VB CERT. We're working with the uh, CERT Foundation to rebuild that program, expand that program. Like many other departments, uh, volunteerism is down right now. So we're working on branding efforts, um, community engagement with CERT, and finding them additional missions. So while we, we like and love the concept of the neighbor help a neighbor and preparing the community, building that resiliency so they have the basic skills to help each other in when there's a large disaster for um, until professional help can come, uh, we, we were looking for other areas they can assist throughout the city, um, get a little bit more engagement, and, and hopefully get some more volunteers there because they're a critical 
a critical volunteer group for us um, during any large incident. Um, and this all cultivates them with our enhancing our training and exercise program as part of the technology enhancements. But we want to validate our plans um, and our expectations, make sure what we're putting in place is going to work. Um, and if not, then we can change that before something happens. So we're working through that. Overall, we're, we're busy. Uh, this is a small snapshot of everything we've accomplished so far this year. Um, again, staff of 10 right now, and, and we're getting a lot done. But that's because of your support and the recognition of the importance of emergency management in, in a city this size and, and the value we add for growing um, and helping the city develop. Um, we are a state and national leader. While many of our surrounding jurisdictions are struggling to hire positions in emergency management, we've had 30, 40 plus applicants from across the country for all our uh, our last couple months of um, openings. We've had applicants from Texas, Kansas, Washington State. Our last program manager just relocated here from Pittsburgh um, because of the reputation we have. And, and that speaks volumes to the program we've, we've built here, the, the value we add, and that's because of the recognition and support from this body. So I thank you for that. And if, if you have any questions. Hey, Barbara. You kept saying that there weren't very many changes in your budget and maybe not from last year. But it's not very long ago that this was a one-person department. Yes, ma'am. Days of Aaron Sutton. Yes. And the things that have happened in the past three or four years has, I mean, it used to be the only thing we worried about was hurricanes. But look at what now we have to, this, this group of people have to do. You've got to deal with the pandemic. You've got to deal with these violent things that happen everywhere. And you never know what's going to happen when. But also our natural disasters are getting to be pretty extensive when we look all around us. So I, I guess you have so many aspects of it now. I, it's I, I could talk all day about everything we have going on and how we're integrating it's across the city. It's a whole new thing. I mean, whoever thought we would be having this building security situation. But we aren't falling back on our ability to respond in a natural disaster, are we? I mean, that's still pretty high. And no, ma'am. Our first priority is always at crisis, which is dealing with internal um, disasters and, and making sure the city can run business continuity and then our incident management and making sure we have a unified approach to deal with any large, large incident, whether it be natural disaster, working with IT for any cyber um, cyber emergency that comes up or cyber incident to, um, you know, man, human caused um, incidents. So it is top priority. We exist to make sure that the city can still function and our citizens have the basic services um, so they stay here and our businesses stay here. Well, it's really amazing how much everything has changed in the past three or four years and that we've come to this point. But it's also awfully good to know that we've got this in, in place now, which we, sit, we didn't need a few years ago. But... Y'all done a great job to cover all of it, and I appreciate your response, and we've called for presentations and so forth, because it's important to keep our citizens aware of just what we've got going on, too. Yes, thank you. And anybody else? But, you know, thanks very much. We are a big city, the biggest one in the Commonwealth. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mr. Mayor, members of council, this is our last and briefest presentation. Hey, hey, hey. CBB Director Nancy Hellman. Are you sending a message? <laughs> I will definitely be brief since I was just here a couple of weeks ago and had the opportunity to catch up with everybody and give you a brief overview as to what's going on at CBB. But um, we'll get our, our presentation up and rolling. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of Council, Mr. Duhini, Mr. Stiles. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share the Convention and Visitors Bureau's budget. Before I begin today, I would like to thank Michelle Boyette, who is here today, um, and the amazing administrative services team at CBB for um, their hard work. Okay. So as a, the destination marketing and tourism department for the city, the CBB has just under 120 FTEs and a little over $39 million. The resort management office officially joined the CBB family in July, but as you can see, the bulk of our funding still supports marketing and tourism related programming. We have three funding sources at CBB, the general fund, which you see a breakdown here. The next slide is the TAP fund, and the majority, majority of our funding is from the tourism advertising program, or the TAP fund which supports our advertising campaigns, public relations, 
marketing and return on investment programming. And I just wanted to, again, thank you for the opportunity to come a couple of weeks ago and, and fill you in on our latest campaign. It's an ever-changing, ever always evolving uh, day at CVB. The last slide is the TIP fund. Again, as you can see, the resort management office, when they joined our team, they're the bulk of the funding that comes out of the TIP fund for us. Because I had the opportunity to present a few weeks ago, I'll move quickly through this section. As you're aware, we are mindfully looking at COVID through the rearview mirror, but keeping a close eye on economic challenges that, me, that may, we may be facing due to inflation. Virginia Beach continues to benefit from being a drive destination with legacy appeal for families and guests. And finally, there's so many exciting things ahead. As I explained in my last presentation, we're onboarding our new advertising agency of record. We're in the final stages of our strategic plan. And of course, we're ready to kick off this most epic season of programming. Um, as a reminder, this is a list of some of the new programming. But of course, we always remain focused on our signature Virginia Beach legacy events as well. And before I wrap up today, I wanted to give a very special thank you to the members of the resort team and the Beach Ambassadors to help make us shine. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions at all? Tell you what, I think that's a compliment to you. We know Thank you, you so much. You're doing a great job. <laughs> and uh, Best keep, meeting of the day. <laughs> keep on going. Thank you. <laughs> and that concludes the, uh, you know, the budget portion of the meeting. Okay, any liaison reports? Any council comments? Okay. Barbara and then Michael. Well, uh, liaison reports, I suppose, this is where I get to tell you that the um, uh, Albemarle Symposium that we had on Friday was an extremely good success. I was just real sorry that some of you all didn't get to come. Um, the, we had probably 150 people there from a very vast backgrounds and agencies. And, and I really hope that what we've got in place now is a, a great amount of uh, data and science that will let us move forward and um, make some uh, accomplishments where we've been, been at a total loss for so long in, in trying to deal with the southern watersheds and the back bay and so forth. But, I really appreciate all the work that the staff did to pull it together, and um, uh, we look forward to moving forward with this group of people who are anxious to get moving now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Michael and then Chris. Um, and then Amelia. Well, you already heard about my um, experience with the fire department, so I, 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 won't, um, I won't share any more about that with you, but I, I do want to talk about uh, something that happened last Thursday. That was a mock city council meeting that was organized by Lansdowne Middle School Civics Department, eighth graders, and um, city staff. Um, Nancy Bloom took the lead on it, and I really, really give her a lot of credit for her work. But many other, I'm not going to start naming because I'm going to leave someone out, but many other members of the staff supported the students in this role. And Council Member Rouse, who represents District 10, where Lansdowne Middle School, um, it, you know, is located, joined as well, and and so did um, City Manager Patrick Tuhaney. And this was a request that we received from Lansdowne Middle School civic students to visit City Hall and learn about the operations of city government. But what was extraordinary is that Mr. Duhaney, Ms. Bloom, and members of the team took it above and beyond and envisioned more than just a chance for them to come on a bus and sit in the chambers and listen to us talk, but actually created an interactive, immersive experience for those students where they had elections, elected a council member and a mayor, and then they um, entered the, then they sat in the dais and they contemplated the same types of decisions that we're contemplating. And it was an experience that I don't think those students will forget. That's one I won't forget. And it was really remarkable and inspiring to watch the students grapple with the same issues that we're grappling with and hear about their perspectives about it. And um, also watch them settle in to their roles as council members and as engaged citizens, which is what civics is all about. And my compliments are 
um, really go go out to um, to Patrick and to all the staff who supported that experience. Also to Council Member Rouse, and I, I'd love for her to share any um, any of her thoughts if she had, which I'm sure she does have some. Um, and I just want to thank you. And I want to also recognize Nick Gauck from Lansdowne Middle School, who is the one who brought this to us. And um, we're doing it again on Friday. So it's going to be great. And I wonder if they're going to vote any differently. <laughs> well, we had a city clerk, a city attorney, we, a Terry. Thank you, Terry. She was a clerk. And she kept that mayor on track. <laughs> And um, <laughs> you good at that, too. <laughs> good at that. And, um, and the city manager, Brian Clark. Yeah. It was just it was just a really great morning. And um, and I thank you very much. Yeah. Jen? Yeah, I'll uh, just to add to it. It was I'm so proud of everything. It's big. I was expecting 30 students. Like when I heard about it, uh, Councilman Bellucci filled me in on it. He's like, hey, the school's in your district. You want to? And I was thinking of tour. I had no clue what the um, what you all had planned. So kudos to the staff and to Nancy and to Brian, to Patrick, and to all the faculty involved. Uh, while I have a, I know Chris, you have something, but um, I want to shout out um, Monica Coping with uh, Phoebe, our, our staff, and Terry. I had uh, I was with the College Park Elementary for their career day, and it was a very last minute thing for me. And I reached out and said, "Hey, do y'all have something that I can sort of set up for kids?" talk about city government and um, they really pull through and I had a really cool table and set up and stickers and candy and um, they just came by for the stickers and candy but <laughs> they also got to see a lot of VB swag and I want to thank Terry and thank uh, Monica Copen for helping uh, provide that material. Do you have any candy Great. left? Good stuff. Okay. Anybody else? <laughs> okay Chris and then Amelia. Councilmember yes, Henley did you want to uh, comment on the joint meeting we had? The joint meeting, the open space, I know you were. Yeah, well, the joint, uh, the Green Ribbon Committee and the Open Space Committee held a joint meeting a week ago uh, because the, the two departments have uh, recognized that with the open space program now reactivating, it's a, a great opportunity to uh, uh, work together to fill in some of the green infrastructure gaps that we have that would be helpful uh, for flooding. And so that brought in the Green Ribbon Committee, which deals with water quality. Um, the, the Open Space Committee is, has been, and I think they're about ready to adopt the uh, criteria that they're going to particularly use to evaluate properties that are uh, recommended or requested for open space. And, uh, and so the, I think having the expertise of the people in these two committees come together is, is very promising. And um, going back to the, the symposium that we had on Friday, even though that dealt with the Albemarle watershed, the, a lot of the, the, the factors, uh, of course, apply to the whole city. One of the, the um, reports that we, we got on Friday was from a Dr. Daniel McLaughlin of Virginia Tech, who has been doing a study for us for the past couple of years uh, dealing with uh, the value of trees as, as in the flooding issue, particularly looking at the process of evapotranspiration. And uh, his presentation was absolutely fantastic. Uh, and, and of course, all of that was recorded, so you would have a chance to see it. But one of the things that he has achieved is you can actually draw just a little quadrant around any particular area and determine how much water is taken out of the, the flooding capacity or the flooding potential through evapotranspiration. And what I think this will allow us to do with the open space program is determine where are there some areas that we can particularly acquire that will be treed areas that will also be a big help in, in the flooding question. Uh, and so, I, like I say, I think we've really developed a great body of science out there uh, that is going to, to help us with projects such as this. But I think the open space capability now to fill in some of the gaps of properties that will be particularly beneficial in, in uh, controlling the flooding issues um, has real potential, and these two committees are working together on that. 
I think it's really great to see our, our boards and commissions work together like this because there are many opportunities that many of them, many of them would have. And you know, when we've got these really uh, terrific people serving in these capacities and willing to give their expertise, uh, we, we, can, we can make it really valuable to us. And, and I appreciate those two committees recognizing that. Thank you. Anything else, Chris? Okay, Amelia and then Worth. I just want to mention on, uh, I was able, along with um, Mayor Dyer, to do a ribbon cutting. It was a bamboo uh, smoothie shop in my district of four, um, which is from the Filipino community, just to see the group that came together to support it, to pray for the success of it, which is really nice. The second thing was we went from there to the state of the city in Chesapeake and Worth also attended that. So for them, just like they come to ours, I think it's so important. And we're very gracious to see um, us coming in, the mayor and the two of us. They announced they are the second largest uh, city next to Virginia Beach. And their theme was the magic of Chesapeake. But it was good meeting others. And the third thing I want to mention is there was a community day held at MOCA in partnership with the Virginia African American Culture Center on April 1st. And they had over 400 come out from Norfolk, from different places on that day. So just showing this regionalism in the arts, in the culture, and you know, we're represented. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Worth? Worth? Real quickly, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Last night I attended the last Weldon Cooper public engagement a session with our, our city. I think that's the 12th session around the city. I thought it was very well run. I thought everyone presented their case and opinion uh, very civilly and well -handed. And I enjoyed myself. I learned a few things and I look forward to the next stage of that uh, <clears throat> public engagement. I think they're going to start taking surveys around the city and then from there. I don't know if we're Okay. Oh, thanks for that update. Anybody else? Okay, at this agenda. point, are we ready for council yes. agenda? So, um, <clears throat> under ordinance and resolutions, number one is to be pulled, and I oh. I two, I five, and Jim White have speakers. Okay, excuse me. Yeah, I, I number five is to be pulled, and number two is to be pulled. Is there some another one? J White, the first planning item. Oh, I mentioned that one. Oh, you know, I haven't gotten the planning yet. Just, you're throwing me off. I'm still on ordinance and resolutions. Okay, so it's I two. And pull. Mm -hmm. And five. Is, are there any other ones that uh, anybody has anything to say on ordinances? I'm going to vote no on three. I just cannot go back to a commitment we made on the bond referendum resolution. Uh, I think we made it to the people that we would be getting quarterly updates. And if we can't find some information out of 21 big projects uh, to give a, a presentation every other month, I think it gives credence to their folks who are out there saying, well, y'all aren't doing anything, because I think it's important that we tell the people what we are doing, and I, I just will not go back on a, on a promise like that. So I'm voting no. Anybody else on, on ordinances and resolutions? Okay, under planning. For um, number three, I also am voting no. Chris. <clears throat> under planning, uh, J1 has been pulled. Um, Kemp's Village, Kempsville District, District 3. Kemp's Village, District 3. Michael? Um, no objection. So J1 and J2 are being pulled? No. J1 is. J1. J1. A number three, um, short term rental. District 6. <coughs> Five. 
number three, Prodan Management, um, District four, Six. Four. Number four. Fourth. Five. Number five, Dewview Davis, Davisville Properties, um, District Six. That's fine. Number six, Elizabeth Darling, District Six. That's fine. All about District Six today. Seven, um, Jayon Sun. Cy Linhaven Fund, District 7. I haven't heard any opposition. You can add it to consent. And then um, Donnie Call, Sam Cape, Henry Plaza, <coughs> District 8. No opposition. Number 9, um, uh, the Ordinance to Amend City Zoning Ordinance, CZO section, on the use of civil penalties. Everybody okay with that? That's it. Okay, uh, thank you. The chair will now entertain a motion to recess into a closed session pursuant to the exemptions from open meetings allowed by section 2.3711A, Code of Virginia, as amended for the following purposes publicly held property, discussion or consideration of acquisition of real property for public purpose or for the of the disposition of publicly held property. Where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body pursuant to section 2.3711A3. That would be District 2. And then legal matters, consultants with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consultants pertaining to the actual or probable litigation where such. Uh, consultation or briefing in an open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the public body pursuant to section 2.2-3711A7, and that would be Lynch versus City of Virginia Beach, and then Army et al. versus City of, of Virginia Beach, and then WC Capital, and then public contract uh, discussions of awards or public contract involving the expenditure or public funds or discussion of the terms of scope of such contract, where discussion in open body would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiation strategy of the public body pursuant to section 2.2-37-11A-29, and that would be Atlantic Park uh, construction contracts. And then <coughs> finally, personnel matters, discussions, considerations, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining or resignation of specific uh, public officers, appointees, or employees of any public body pursuant to 2.2311A1, and that would be council appointments, council boards, commissions, committees, authorities, agencies, and appointees. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. 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 All righty. Councilmember Berlucci. Aye. Councilmember Hammond? Aye. Councilmember Walton? Aye. Councilmember Remick? Aye. Councilmember Ralph? Aye. Councilmember Rouse? Aye. Councilmember Shulman? Aye. Councilmember Taylor? Aye. Councilmember Wooten? Aye. Vice Mayor Wilson? Aye. Mayor Dyer? Aye. I vote 11 Missouri Okay, great. We were kind of a little back a better on uh, schedule, so if it's okay, let's take a short break. Okay, we recess.